a global catastrophe began in the world, during which the temperature on Earth became unsuitable for life. Ninety-five percent of all residents died in the first minutes after the disaster began, while the survivors tried to do everything not to die. From the lack of food resources, people began to lose their minds, and many began to create their own colonies, in which people killed and robbed anyone who caught their eye after which they ate them. Zhang Yu was one of the few who managed not to die at the beginning of the disaster, but within a few days he died due to his naivety, after which one of the colonies stole his supplies and ate his remains. Zhang later wakes up in his apartment safe and sound even before the great disaster began. Then Zhang learns that, apparently, he is being reborn at a point in time when there was about a month left before the start of the disaster. The cause of this global cataclysm was the fall of a meteorite, due to which the temperature on Earth ranged from minus 60 to minus 70 degrees Celsius. Jean thought that now he must ensure his own safety and accumulate supplies as quickly as possible, after which he wanted to take revenge on those bandits who killed him. Jean also did not forget that in addition to protection and provisions, he must take care of weapons in order to be able to repel those people if they wanted to break in on him. Immediately Jean finds himself in another dimension, which he wanted to equip as a warehouse with various resources. John thought that if he managed to transfer all his supplies to this dimension, then he could easily survive decades in such harsh conditions. After this, John thought that during the global apocalypse, he would no longer be able to enjoy various delicacies, and the first thing he decides to do is to gorge himself on his favorite food. Then John went to one of the most elite restaurants in Tianhai where he ordered himself a bunch of different food worth several tens of thousands of yuan. John devoured everything that was brought to him with wild appetite, thinking about how during the disaster people prayed to taste some noodles. A few hours later, John left the restaurant, and the waiter offered him a VIP customer card, but John refused such a gift from the establishment. Zhang's girlfriends were passing by, who happened to notice him and thought that Zhang was not as poor as they had imagined him to be. When these friends decided to greet Zhang, he saw Yu Qin, the same friend because of whom he was killed that time. However, Zhang did not dwell on this and told his friends that he was heading to the store to buy some things. Then the friends said that they were just about to buy a few things, and then they decided to all go to the store together. Entering one of the nearby stores, the friends were surprised that Chang began buying almost all the products in the store. Chang said that different things can happen in life, and that you need to be prepared for anything, for example, a global ice age. The friends did not take Shang's idea seriously and offered him to treat them to dinner for their help, to which Chang suggested that they have a joint dinner next month since now he had a lot of urgent matters. Yu Qin's friend couldn't hold back her emotions and said that Chang was going to the store and buying such a large amount of food on her own. Yu Qin told Zhang that her friend was just tired, and she asked not to take her words seriously. Then this friend began to apologize to Zhang and tell him that he was a very good person. A couple of hours later, Zhang and her friends were about to leave the store with carts that were filled to the brim with various foods. Zhang noticed the confused looks of passers-by but he did not care at all, since he was haunted only by the thought of surviving and avenging his death. At this moment, Aunt Lin passed by Zhang with her little grandson, who was surprised at the large amount of food that Zhang bought. Aunt Lin was surprised and scared at the same time that Zhang could easily leave people without food while her grandson tried to steal a chocolate bar from Zhang's cart without being noticed. Zhang noticed how his chocolate was almost stolen and he immediately takes it away from the child. Then the kid started yelling at Zhang and threatening him that he would kill him if he didn't give up the chocolate. The words of the petty thief did not frighten Zhang, and in response he threatened the child. Then the baby, in tears, grabbed onto Aunt Lin, who began to criticize Zhang for trying to raise her grandson. After that, Aunt Lin said that she was going to buy chocolate from Zhang, while telling her that she would bring him the money later. Instead of giving the chocolate bar, Zhang held out the phone in front of her and said that she either pays for the chocolate bar right now, or goes to the store and buys the chocolate bar there herself. Then Aunt Lin got even angrier and began to threaten Zhang that he would still pay for his greed, but Zhang himself no longer paid any attention to her. After a while, Zhang was already at home with all his purchases, and Yu Qing kept reminding him to invite Chang to visit them. After this, Zhang decides to see how some of the food in his dimension will be stored after which he was going to start searching for medicine. Zhang also did not forget that he needed to get firearms as quickly as possible, since it would be very difficult to get them now, 
while getting melee weapons and a bow and arrows was not difficult. The next day, John decides to check what happened to the food he left in his dimension. John noticed that the meat and vegetables were fine, while the fish was spoiled, since time passes differently in his dimension, and then John decides to conduct the same experiment with ready-made products. Afterwards, John called on the phone and said that he was organizing a huge party for his friends. Then the administrator answered the phone and told John that his order would cost at least one million yuan, and that he would have to make an advance payment of two hundred thousand yuan. John transferred the prepayment amount, and after that he went to leave his house as collateral. After John mortgaged his house, he received 6 million yuan in his account and began to count further expenses for home renovation, medicine and weapons, from which he concluded that he did not have enough money for all expenses. At that moment, Zhang was approached by one person who wanted to offer Zhang the services of the company for which he works. Zhang was pleased that he had so quickly found a way to quickly get a large sum of money. After some time, this man brought Shang to his boss to discuss all the conditions for issuing money to Shang. The director began to find out from Zhang what amount and for how long he wanted to receive from him. Zhang said that he needed to get as much money as possible as quickly as possible, and that he would return all the money within three months, regardless of the interest rate. Before signing the contract, the director asked Zhang for something as collateral. Zhang offered to take his house and his expensive car, which together were worth more than 5 million yuan, as collateral, and then the director began to doubt that Zhang would be able to return all the money on time. Then Zhang tried to persuade the director to at least slightly reduce the total loan amount to at least 4 million, with the condition that he would return him as much as 7 million yuan. The director accepts these conditions and Zhang signs the agreement, after which he left the office. Zhang was pleased that the director actually gave him these 4 million since he was sure that in less than a month these people would immediately die after the disaster began, and he would not have to return this money. After this, Zhang decided to go to the office of one of the largest security companies, John Long, which provides high-class protection to various celebrities and politicians. Huai Rin, the manager of the commercial department of the security company, approached Zhang. Huai greeted Zhang. And Zhang immediately approached him with the question of creating a shelter that would be able to withstand any consequences of the end of the world. Huai told Zhang that their company could do everything necessary to create such a shelter, after which he provided Zhang with some diagrams of various variations of shelters. Among the features of the shelter, the drawings included very thick steel walls, bulletproof glass, a high-tech ventilation system, an advanced video surveillance system and armored doors. As Zhang examined the plans for the shelter, he thought that the most important thing for him was to make his house a large metal box that would withstand extremely low temperatures and through which no one could leak. Huai also added that their company is able to create a shelter almost anywhere, regardless of the size and location of the house. In between, Huai also told Zhang that before he became a manager in this company, he was an international mercenary and therefore he himself knows a lot about such shelters. Zhang was very interested in these words, and he decides to ask the manager if he can get him a firearm. Huai said that he could not immediately resolve this issue, to which Zhang said that the other day he accidentally ran into several guys who had machine guns with them. Huai said that he had some contacts with people who could provide him with weapons, but he also worried that he could not easily provide weapons to a stranger. Huai told Zhang that the construction of the shelter should take up to two weeks, and in the meantime he would try to resolve the issue of obtaining weapons for Zhang, for which Zhang was very grateful. Next, Zhang was going to start purchasing melee weapons, such as an axe, clubs, and so on. After some time, Zhang went to the hunting store to buy a crossbow and arrows for it. Fortunately for Zhang, he had a hunter's license, thanks to which he could be calm in the event that someone suddenly discovered a crossbow on him. About an hour later, Zhang arrived home where several food trucks and a bewildered crowd of residents had already gathered. Zhang approached the uncle who was not missing the delivery and told him that he was the one who ordered such a large delivery and that these trucks could go further. Meanwhile, the neighbors were discussing how much Zhang could spend on such a large order. Among the neighbors present was also Yu Qin, who was thinking that Zhang really had so much money and that she should not embarrass herself in front of him. Zhang, of course, noticed Yu Qin among the crowd but he pretended not to notice her and thought that he would send her to the next world at the first opportunity. A few minutes later, 
A pile of boxes containing various culinary delicacies from the hotel stood in front of Zhang. Looking at these boxes, Zhang couldn't stop thinking that all these goodies now belonged to him, and that he could enjoy them for the rest of his life, after which he immediately began to move these boxes to his dimension. The next day, Construction workers and engineers from a security company came to Dang's home to transform Zhang's entire apartment into an impenetrable fortress. Meanwhile, Zhang's neighbors began to suspect that he had become somehow abnormal, since he began to buy large quantities of food and make an impenetrable fortress out of his house. At that moment, manager Huai wrote to Zhang, who wanted to inform him that one of his acquaintances would give Zhang a firearm within three days. After correspondence, he informs the security company employees that he will move to a hotel room during construction. Later, Zhang went to the warehouse of an acquaintance of his, who was the manager of the warehouse, to ask him to take all the contents of the warehouse for double the price and get a short vacation for himself. Once at the warehouse, Zhang realized that he would have enough of those products, tools and other things that would be useful to him at the time of the disaster. At the warehouse, Zhang noticed that Zhou Pun, one of the warehouse workers, was about to ask Yu Qing to a concert over the weekend, to which she replied that she had a date planned that weekend. At this moment, Zhou Pun noticed Zhang and began to blame him for the fact that because of their trip to the store yesterday, Yu Qing's back hurt a lot. Yu Qing interrupted Zhou Pun and said that she was not in pain, and that she just had a little tingling in her lower back. Then Zhang realized that Yu Qing had already blabbed everything to everyone yesterday. Zhou Pun did not stop blaming Zhang and demanded that Zhang give Yu Qing 500 yuan per doctor as compensation. Zhang told Zhou Pun that Yu Qing herself decided to help him, and that Zhou Pun had no right to tell him. Zhou Pun was very frightened by Zhang's behavior and advised Yu Qing stay as far away from Zhang as possible. Yu Qing was also scared because of how much Zhang had changed in the past few days. On the same day, Yu Qin decides to write to Zhang and personally find out from him what happened to him, that he changed so much in such a short period of time. Yu Qin was very annoyed that she decided to write to Zhang first, while he completely ignored her messages. Then Yu Qin decides to ask her friend what she personally thinks about such changes in Zhang. The friend says that Zhang is simply abnormal, and that Yu Qin should not focus his attention on this. About a week later, Zhang received his shipment of firearms with which he can fight back anyone who even tries to break into his home. A little later, Zhang also received a large package containing various medicines and first aid items. After that, Zhang said that he needed to order some more things and he asked the courier to help him with it. The courier agrees to help, and at that moment Zhang receives a message from the manager of the security company saying that the conversion of Zhang's house into a shelter has already been completed. A few minutes later, Zhang was already in his apartment in which all the walls were sheathed with a thick layer of hardened steel. Manager Huai also described how his workers introduced an advanced ventilation system into the apartment and improved the thermal insulation system. They also installed armored bulletproof glass in all the windows in the house, which was even stronger than all the steel cladding in the house. In addition, workers provided the entire building with a video surveillance system of 300 cameras, with which you can monitor all floors at once. Zhang thanked the manager and his company for such a good result. When manager Huai left the apartment, Zhang felt sorry that the manager would hardly be able to evaluate the effectiveness of the bunker when the end of the world came. Meanwhile, Zhang finally received his last order in the form of a whole truck of clean water, because during the apocalypse it will be the most difficult to obtain. Uncle Yu, who was very kind to Zhang, decided to ask him why exactly Zhang ordered so much water. Zhang told Uncle Yu to quickly prepare supplies of food and water before they became too expensive, since very low temperatures were forecast for the winter. During the conversation, Uncle Yu's boss intervened and assured him that Zhang should not be trusted under any circumstances. Uncle Yu said that his boss just got a little excited and asked him not to hold a grudge against him. In the remaining days, Zhang decided not to waste money and he spent all his money down to the last yuan in places such as various bars and restaurants. Zhang also did not stop buying mountains of food from stores for his warehouse. Zhang also learned to shoot weapons and went to the gym so that during a disaster no one would have a chance to resist him. Three days before the disaster, Zhang comes to work early so that no one would suspect him of missing most of all the things in the warehouse, and adds sleeping pills to his colleague's tea. After a couple of minutes, Zhang returns to his colleagues and invites them all to relax and drink a mug of tea. All the workers, 
without exception, decided that they really could use a little rest, and they all sat down to drink tea together. Half an hour later, all the warehouse employees are fast asleep, and then Zhang decides to start stealing things from the warehouse. Before taking all the items from the warehouse, Zhang turns off the entire security system and all CCTV cameras so as not to create too much noise around him. After this, Zhang began to move all the boxes in the warehouse to his dimension in a matter of seconds. Zhang collected absolutely everything from the warehouse into his dimension. Gasoline, toys, food, household supplies and much more. A few minutes later, Zhang moved almost all the things into his dimension leaving one small batch of goods in the corner. Zhang decided to look at the contents of the boxes, and they found sets of clothing that can withstand extremely low temperatures, which could be very useful in end-of-the-world conditions. After that, there was not a single box left in the warehouse that Zhang did not take to his dimension. Later, Zhang returns to his sleeping colleagues and knocks out the sleeping pills so that no one will think that it was Zhang who stole all the things in the warehouse. A couple of hours later, colleagues started waking Zhang up to tell him that someone had stolen all the items from the warehouse. Once at the warehouse, Zhang pretended that he was very shocked that someone had completely robbed their warehouse in such a time. Then one of the employees approached Zhang with a phone in his hands, through which the director called Zhang. Zhang picked up the phone and heard the voice of the director who wanted to find out what was happening in their warehouse. Zhang said that they don't know yet how this all happened, and he said that in the last two hours, all the items have disappeared from the warehouse. Hearing this, the director's voice became even angrier, and he began to blame Zhang for everything that was happening. Then Zhang tried to convince the director that he could not empty the entire warehouse alone in those two hours. Zhang also added that on their own they will not find out the reason for the loss of such a quantity of goods and that they need to contact the relevant authorities so that they can conduct an investigation and figure it out. Gang's proposal and said that he would contact the general director to contact the necessary people for the investigation. After the call, John told his colleagues not to worry about what was happening, and that the director would send specialists to them to conduct an investigation. John then told the employees that everything would be fine if they cooperated with the investigation and that it was not their fault that they all fell asleep at work. One of the representatives of the investigative commission told Zhang that if he found out any details about this, he should report it to them. The representative of the investigative commission also asked Zhang not to leave the city until the end of the investigation, but Zhang had no intention of leaving anywhere. While Zhang was walking down the street to his house, he saw news on a large screen on the building that talked about a case of the theft of a large consignment of goods in one of the city's warehouses. There were only two days left of the global ice age but already there was a sharp drop in temperature outside. People on the street in panic began to urgently return to their homes so as not to freeze. John, too, did not stay on the street for too long and decides to return home, still thinking that in a couple of days the world familiar to everyone will cease to exist. After two days, due to the explosion of the sun, the temperature on Earth began to drop sharply, thereby causing a real ice age on Earth. People were panicked and no one wanted to leave their homes so as not to accidentally freeze to death on the street. John watched everything that was happening on the street now, and realized that the time of the great extinction of mankind had come. John sat at home and read messages from friends who continued to be surprised by the weather. John understood that snow would fall continuously for at least three months, causing the temperature to drop even more. The very next morning there was so much snow outside that people could not leave their homes as the snow completely blocked the doors. Even in their homes, people continued to freeze, and no one knew what to do about it, since few people had warm clothes. Meanwhile, Zhang slept peacefully in his bed, and the problem of global cooling did not bother him at all. Suddenly, someone decided to call Zhang in the middle of the night, and it turned out to be Yu Qin. Yu Qin was going to ask Zhang whether he knew before that day about the beginning of the global cataclysm. Zhang said that he just happened to hear about it from a friend one day. Then Yu Qin decided to ask Zhang why he did not warn her about the beginning of the disaster. Zhang decides to interrupt the phone conversation and hang up, which scared Yu Qin very much. Yu Qin felt that Zhang was crazy and that she urgently needed to do something. Zhang decides to ignore Yu Qin and plans to watch the news over breakfast. Zhang eats a medium rare steak, washes it down with wine, and watches the news talk about global cooling. According to the news, it was strongly recommended not to leave home unless absolutely necessary. Be sure to dress warmly, 
and under no circumstances believe rumors about shortages or sharp rises in prices for goods. Zhang, of course, did not believe that the snowfall would end soon, since everything was happening exactly the same as last time. While eating, Yu Qin writes to Zhang asking him to give her some food, while promising that she will return all the costs of food to him. Zhang just grinned at Yu Qin's naivety for thinking that he would just give her part of his reserves. Instead, Zhang decides to tease Yu Qing and send her a photo of his steak and wine. Yu Qing was in an unprecedented shock that while she was starving, Zhang had the conscience to send her such a photo. Out of anger, Yu Qing wanted to send an insulting message to Zhang, but at one point she thought that she could not allow Zhang to completely stop communicating with her. After corresponding with Yu Qing, Zhang decides to look through the video surveillance system to see what the current situation is in the building. Through the cameras, Shan saw Auntie Lin trying to convince residents not to leave the building until the snowfall ended before leaving the building. Aunt Lin assured people that the snowfall would end in two or three days, and that there was no need for them to go to stores to buy supplies. People tried to pass by saying that no one knew exactly when the snowfall would end, and that if they did not have time to prepare supplies, the prices of goods would rise greatly. Aunt Lin continued to discourage people from going to stores for fear of shortages and increases in goods prices. Zhang appeared from the crowd with a warning to Aunt Lin that if the snow continues to fall continuously and people die of hunger, then only she will bear all responsibility. People supported Zhang's statements and tried to find out from Aunt Lin what the plan would be in case everyone started running out of supplies. Aunt Lin tried to calm the neighbors' discontent by telling them that the snowstorm would soon subside and that no one would be short of supplies. After that, she asked Zhang not to create panic among people, because, according to her, he was breaking the law in this way. Zhang returned to his apartment and said that under no circumstances would he go outside. Aunt Lin was very angry with Zhang's behavior and began to think about how she could take revenge for this. Several days have passed since the beginning of the cataclysm, and Zhang, as if nothing had happened, is just sitting on the couch, eating various treats and playing video games. Zhang thought that it was much easier and more enjoyable for him to spend time playing games than to somehow have any kind of relationship with people. At one point, Zhang received a message from Aunt Lin, in which she asked Zhang to remove all the snow from the entrances to the house. Zhang thought that Aunt Lin specifically wrote this request in the general chat, which included all the residents of the building. In response, Zhang wrote that there was no point in going and clearing the snow now and that it would be better to wait until the snowfall ended. The residents of the house supported Zhang's words, which made Aunt Lin very angry. Then she decides to write in the chat that Zhang wants to turn all the residents against her, and that such a young and strong youth as Zhang should take the initiative and help his neighbors. She then ordered Zhang, on behalf of the district committee, to go and clear the snow from the street right away. Zhang understood that she was hiding behind her position and was going to turn everyone against him while the rest of the residents were waiting for the moment when Zhang would resort to rudeness and insults. Then Zhang writes that among the list of people she chose to clear the snow, there is not a single rich person, hinting to her that she is simply afraid to tell them something. Then people again supported Zhang, citing the fact that when everyone is in danger, and Lin sends only middle-class people to do hard work. In the same house lived Jing Hao and Su Hao, two influential people who had their own certain connections and strong influence. Zhang then suggests that Aunt Lin ask these people to help her clear the snow. It was Jing Hao who broke down the door to Zhang's apartment with an axe, and Su Hao was the first to thrust a knife into Zhang, which is why he died in his previous life. Zhang was serious about dealing with these people once and for all. Aunt Lin was very annoyed by Zhang's stubbornness and she thought that he deliberately cited Jing Hao and Su Hao as an example so as not to go out himself. Aunt Lin also began to worry that if she gave Zhang some slack, she would no longer be taken seriously. Later, Jing Hao noticed a message in the general chat in which Aunt Lin asks him and Su Hao to go and clear the snow outside. Jing Hao was angry at this decision, and he decides to tell her in the most aggressive manner what he thinks about all this. Later, Su Hao tells Aunt Lin that he does not intend to go outside in such cold weather, and that he would rather spend the entire day in bed. On top of that, Su Hao decides to send a video message to the general chat, in which he tells the residents of the house that let the others go clear the snow. Aunt Lin became even more angry with Zhang for turning such powerful people against her. While Zhang was preparing lunch for himself, Aunt Lin called him 
who told Zhang that he was trying in every possible way to complicate her life and relationships with her neighbors. Zhang replied that the whole point of her life was to be scolded by someone. Zhang also threatened Aunt Lin that if she did not leave him alone, she would regret it very much. Aunt Lin was very unhappy with this outcome of events, and she really wanted to give Zhang a lesson for his insubordination. Jing Hao tried to break into Zhang's house, who wanted to talk to him about those messages. Zhang then stood up from the sofa picked up his loaded crossbow and prepared to finish off Xing Hao. Zhang prepared to shoot in case Xing Hao was still able to demolish the door to the apartment. However, Zhang thinks that simply killing Xing Hao would be too boring, and he decides to mock him and aim for his leg. Seconds later, Zhang shoots Xing Hao in the leg through one of the holes in the door. From incredible pain, Xing Hao falls to the floor with a shot in his leg, from which blood continuously flows. Zhang believed that with such a low temperature and a deep wound, Zheng Hao would not live long. Meanwhile, Zheng Hao tried his best to get to his apartment to treat his wound. At this moment, the frightened and seriously injured Zheng Hao finally reached the elevator. When the elevator reached the desired floor, Zheng Hao tried to call an ambulance so that doctors could help him with his injured leg. However, due to the harsh weather outside, no one responded to Zheng Hao, so he had to administer first aid to himself. Once home Zheng Hao began looking for a first aid kit, and trying to pull the arrow out of his leg. At one point, Xing Hao thought that if his leg was still frozen, he could simply pull out the arrow with his hands. When Xing Hao finally pulled the arrow out of his leg, he decides to write to Zhang in the general chat that he will personally deal with him, to which Zhang replied that if he tries to break into his apartment again, then next time he will just kill Xing Hao. Everyone was shocked that Zhang not only fought back Xing Hao, but also injured him. After this, Xing Hao calls his people to inform them that they need to get rid of one kid. Xing Hao's apartment, and Xing Hao explained to the people that they had to get rid of one guy who wounded him in the leg. A couple of minutes later, guys armed with bladed weapons stood near the door to Zhang's apartment and demanded that he leave the apartment. Without waiting for an answer, one of the thugs tried to break through the door to Zhang's apartment with the help of a huge cleaver. However, despite the powerful swing of the weapon, the door was not damaged in any way, and the cleaver itself flew away from the door towards one of the thugs, almost killing him. The group of thugs were surprised that such a simple boy had such a strong door. At this time, Zhang was playing video games and watched as a group of thugs unsuccessfully tried to break into his apartment. At first, Zhang decides to use firearms against them, but after thinking a little, he decides to douse these thugs. Zhang sticks a hose through one hole in the door and begins dousing the thugs with cold water. From such an attack, all the thugs were completely wet, causing them to fall to the floor and slowly become covered with a thin layer of ice. After such a water attack, Zhang returned to the sofa and continued to watch the thugs through the cameras. At this time, several thugs were sitting in Zhang Hao's apartment trying to warm up after Zhang poured water on them. They explained to Zhang Hao that Chang's door was too thick to be broken through so easily. Despite the thugs' unsuccessful attempt to deal with Zhang, Zhang Hao did not despair as he was confident that sooner or later Zhang would get out of the apartment. Then Jing Hao ordered his guys to watch Zhang around the clock and kill him as soon as he decided to open the door of his apartment. At this time, several neighbors went outside and removed all the snow that had appeared. But despite all their efforts, the snow was falling much faster than they could remove it, and without a snowblower it would be almost impossible to remove such a thick layer of snow. Zhang just looked at all this and thought that these people simply did not understand the full scale of the disaster, and that with such efforts they would not be able to avoid such a cataclysm. Zhang later sat down to watch the news, which reported the disaster's many victims, numbering between 10 and 200 million people around the world. Zhang looked at all this and realized that the number of victims of such a cataclysm would only grow rapidly. At this moment, Aunt Lin continued to say that the snowstorm would end very soon, and that there was no need to go to the shops and stock up on provisions now. A little later, Zhang wrote to Yu Qing to find out if he was alive, but Zhang understood that now she would again ask him for supplies. Then Zhang decides to tease Yu Qing once again and sends her a photo of the lobster he just ate. Yu Qing and her friend were shocked that instead of helping them, Zhang was only mocking them. Then Yu Qing's friend writes to Zhang that his actions greatly upset Yu Qing. Zhang, in turn, writes that Yu Qing's mood is constantly changing, and that this does not bother him at all. Here Yu Qing's friend tries to push for pity and make Zhang feel ashamed for sending them such photos while they are both now dying of hunger. She also added that he was extremely unserious towards Yu Qing, 
which in turn did not affect Zhang in any way. Zhang confirmed the words of his friend Yu Qin that he was absolutely indifferent to her, which only angered her more. After such an unpleasant correspondence with Zhang, Yu Qin's friend decided to find out if she had anyone else to whom she could turn for help. Yu Qin then remembered Zhou Ping, and she immediately called him to ask for his help. A couple of hours later, Zhou Peng was already at the door of Yu Qing's apartment to give them some food from the store. Yu Qing was a little scared that Zhou Peng loved her so much, since he left the house in such cold especially for her, and even went to the store to get supplies for them. After three days, electricity suddenly ran out in all apartments, which once again indicated that this cataclysm would occur in the same way as the one during which Zhang died. The residents of the house are in a panic, many have run out of supplies, and they began to think that they urgently need to prepare supplies. At this time, Zhang was thinking that in this situation, the management company would no longer help them. A few minutes later, Zhang took out a couple of generators and turned them on so that he would have at least some source of electricity, after which the light appeared in his apartment. Meanwhile, Aunt Lin, hiding in a blanket with her grandson, did not stop thinking that just a few days ago everything in their world and everyone was in order. Aunt Lin noticed in the general chat how people began to talk about a set of supplies, and she decided that she needed to stock up on everything necessary before general panic began among the residents. Then Aunt Lin wrote in the general chat that the problems were only temporary, and that everyone should cooperate with the management company, or the residents would be transferred to the police. People did not pay attention to the appeal of some old woman, since this did not change their difficult situation in any way. Meanwhile, Xing Hao read all these messages and did not understand how this old woman could command them like that in such a situation. Xing Hao's thugs only complained that they had run out of supplies of medicine and that they could not get out of here, to which Xing Hao only yelled at his subordinates, calling them useless trash. Meanwhile, Zhang was still spending his time playing games, and at one point someone wrote to him. It was Aunt Lin and she wrote that since all the residents were in such an unpleasant situation, then everyone, including him, should send all their supplies to the management company, which in turn would divide all the residents' supplies equally. Before Zhang could finish reading the messages, he almost immediately received a couple of new personal messages from Aunt Lin. In these messages, Aunt Lin asked Zhang to share with everyone the supplies that he had recently bought by the cartload. Zhang remembered how last time he was also asked to help with supplies, and that time he shared, which led to his death. Then he told her that she should also share the supplies that she would collect, because she was one of the reasons for his death. It only made Auntie Lin even more angry that the person in charge of the warehouse like Zhang couldn't share the supplies. Then she threatened Zhang that in this situation he was going against the orders of the management organization. Zhang only said that he was indeed short of supplies right now, and that she couldn't share her supplies with him first if she decided to take the initiative to share the common supplies. Such statements made Aunt Lin even more angry, and she said that if Zhang refused to cooperate with the management company, he would suffer heavy punishment. Zhang in turn told her that she was just an employee of the district committee, and that she could not pose any unnecessary threat to him. Aunt Lin hung up and began cursing Zhang, also thinking about how she could influence him. At first, Aunt Lin wanted to incite her neighbors against Zhang, but then she thought that in this case, people would understand that they need not give their supplies to everyone. Later, Zhang observed through cameras how neighbors voluntarily donate their supplies to Auntie Lin. Zhang thought that these people themselves were to blame for the fact that they gave her their supplies so easily and obediently, and that the supplies would only be spent faster, which would lead to their quick death. Meanwhile, Aunt Lin greedily consumed all the neighbor's supplies with her grandson instead of distributing these supplies among the residents. At this moment, someone called Aunt Lin, and it turned out to be Xing Hao. Xing Hao told Aunt Lin that she had made a good living from her neighbor's supplies. Aunt Lin tried to justify herself by saying that all the neighbor's supplies were now in her possession under the pretext of storage, after which Xing Hao asked her to share some supplies. She said that for some reason she couldn't just share the general supplies with everyone. Then Xing Hao demanded that she give her the supplies, otherwise his thugs would break into her home and steal all the supplies from there. Within minutes, the thugs broke into Aunt Lin's apartment and were about to take all the supplies out of her apartment. Aunt Lin tried to stop them, 
but at that very second she received a strong blow to the face for deceiving all the neighbors and for trying to keep all the supplies for herself. John watched all this through cameras and received incredible emotions from what was happening. Then John comes up with the idea to post a post in the general chat so that everyone can see how greedy and harsh Aunt Lin is. While Aunt Lin was lying on the floor, Jing Hao and his thugs began to search the apartment for supplies. Aunt Lin begged Jing Hao to leave some supplies for her and her grandson. Instead, Jing Hao pushes Aunt Lin away with such force that she flies to the other side of the room and is knocked unconscious. Then Aunt Lin's little grandson decides to avenge his grandmother and stabs one of the thugs with a knife. The thug immediately turns around and kicks the boy in the stomach with all his might. From such a blow, the boy flies into the wall unconscious and falls onto the sofa with a lifeless face. Aunt Lin, with tears in her eyes, tries with all her might to bring her grandson back to consciousness, but her attempts were unsuccessful. At this moment, Xing Hao and his thugs took out all the supplies they found from Aunt Lin's apartment and left the apartment. Meanwhile, the neighbors in the chat did not stop discussing what happened to Aunt Lin and her grandson, and Zhang was quite happy with this outcome of events. At the same time, Zhang knew that very soon all his neighbors would suffer exactly the same fate as Aunt Lin. A little later, a message comes into the chat from Aunt Lin, in which she asks the neighbors to provide some drugs so that Dr. Zhou can perform an operation on her grandson. Dr. Zhou was a first aid doctor at a local hospital who treated people, saved them during the disaster, and was one of the few people who was kind to Zhang. At this moment, Aunt Lin did not stop asking her neighbors for help with supplies to which people responded with either ridicule or condemnation for trying to appropriate other people's supplies. Jean was amazed at Dr. Zhou's integrity, who, even in such difficult times, did not stop providing medical care to people. During all this time, there was so much snow that the first floors of multi-story buildings were very soon covered with a thick layer of snow. Those people who did not have time to return home and take refuge there from the cold very quickly died from such cold. Meanwhile, Aunt Lin began asking neighbors to share food for her and her grandson, and one of the residents responded to such a message by offering her a couple of packs of noodles for 1,000 yuan each, to which Zhang replied that he was ready to buy noodles from her for 2,000 yuan. People in the chat began to reassure each other that winter had simply arrived a little earlier this year, and that this was not the end of the world, like some kind of zombie apocalypse. Jean never ceased to be amazed by the naivety of people who still believe that this will all end soon. Later, Sean decides to write to the girl that he is ready to buy these noodles from her for any price she names, thinking to himself that this money will still not help anyone survive this cataclysm. A little later, a single mother with a baby writes to the general chat, who told Zhang that she and her child have nothing to eat now, and that these noodles will be their salvation to which Zhang replied that he simply offered a higher price, and that this girl she can choose who she will give the noodles to. A single mother begged her neighbors to help her because her daughter was only nine months old, and that her mother could not feed her milk because she had not eaten anything for a long time. Zhang understood that this single mother is not as simple as it seems, because last time she also fought for her life and the life of her daughter to the last. A week and a half later, Zhang received a call from Yuqin again who, according to Zhang's calculations, should have run out of all supplies. Zhang answers the video call to tease Yuqin and her friend a little about his supplies, and they are both shocked that Zhang still hasn't run out of supplies. Zhang told Yuqin and her friend that he had a lot of fast food at home food, because he is too lazy to cook regular food. Zhang also wanted to show off his fireplace to them thanks to which his home is always warm. Yuqin couldn't help herself and started calling Zhang all the nice names she knew and at the same time she begged Zhang to let them in. Zhang, not wanting to help Yu Qing in any way, tells her that in this weather it would be better for her to stay home. Then Zhang decided not to stop bullying Yu Qing and her friend, and he noticed that judging by their appearance, they were now very cold. The fact that Zhang not only refused to help Yu Qing, but also mocked them, made Yu Qing very angry. Zhang then decided to remind Yu Qing that her friend Zhou Peng did not help her like last time. Zhang wanted to clarify to Yu Qing the fact that he was absolutely not obligated to help her in any way in such a situation, after which he hung up. Yu Qing even more, who never received any help from Zhang. Yu Qing's friend said that they were unable to immediately understand Zhang's intentions to prepare for the cataclysm and that now they had forever missed the opportunity to escape. Yu Qin's friend added that now Zhang is even cooler than Su Hao, 
because now his money will not help in such a situation. From such words, Yu Qin rushed at her friend, which is why they started a fight with each other. At this time, Zhang was watching the news, which conveyed information that the authorities would now provide electricity for only one hour a day so that people could charge their phones, put on kettles and use other small household appliances. John understood that the situation was becoming so critical that they did not hide it even on TV. After watching the news, John decides to see what his neighbors are writing in the general chat, and when he entered it, he saw how people did not stop offering their noodles for exorbitant prices. John was both frightened and amused by the fact that despite the seriousness of this situation in the world, people do not stop trying to gain profit in the form of money, which will very soon become nothing. After the fight, Yu Qin and her friend began to think about who else they could turn to for help. Then Yu Qin decides to break into Zhang's apartment by any means, and she decides to turn to Zhou Peng for help. An hour later, Zhou Peng was already at Yu Qin's apartment, where she told him that Zhang had deliberately humiliated her and was teasing her with his supplies. Zhou Peng said that he would do his best to make Zhang very sorry for bullying Yu Qin like that. Yu Qin tells Zhou Peng that if they can get rid of Zhang, they can move into his apartment, which has a lot of supplies. Then Zhou Peng, Yu Qin, and her friend went to Zhang's apartment to kill him. After a couple of minutes, they took out a baton with a pair of cutlasses and prepared to wait for the moment when John left the apartment. John noticed that Zhou Peng had come to him, and he understood that he clearly came to him with bad intentions. Looking a little closer, John noticed that he had come to him with Yu Qing and her friend with bladed weapons to kill him and take his supplies. Then John decides to pour cold water on them, just like those thugs who recently came to him. However, John remembered that he had a whole bucket of waste, which he decided to use against the uninvited guests. Meanwhile, Zhou Peng was telling Zhang that he was running out of supplies at home, and that he decided to ask Zhang for some supplies. Zhou Peng believed that now Zhang would open the door, and they would have a chance to finish him off. But contrary to Zhou Peng's expectations, Zhang did not come out, and a pile of rotten waste flew into their faces. Then Zhou Peng began to threaten Zhang that he would kill him, while the girls became ill from the waste. Then Zhang said that these were the supplies that he wanted to give them and that they should be grateful to him for such mercy. Then Zhou Ping decides to get into Zhang's apartment on his own, from which he receives a very powerful electric shock to his hand. From such pain, Zhou Ping immediately fell to the floor, which made Zhang laugh very much. After this, Zhang leans back on the sofa with the thought that he may never leave his apartment again in his entire life, and that he can simply watch what is happening without any fear. The next morning, John is awakened by very loud noises that sound like gunshots, and he decides to find out what is happening in the house. John then decides to look through the CCTV cameras to see exactly what happened in the house. When John picked up the tablet, he saw neighbors collecting snow from the street to melt it and use it as water. John lay in bed and thought that the residents on the third floor were doomed, since most of the residents on this floor had run out of supplies. Meanwhile, Xinghao sends a couple of photographs to the general chat one of which showed the corpses of a young couple whom he killed in their own apartment. Zhang was somewhat surprised by Jing Hao's determination and dedication, which once again proved that he could afford a good life even in such conditions. However, Zhang also understood that Jing Hao had a very limited amount of ammunition and would not be able to shoot all the residents. At this moment, a new chat appeared on Zhang's phone in which the neighbors were all discussing a plan to resist Jing Hao. At one point, Uncle Yu wrote that if they do not join forces against Jing Hao, then he will simply kill off all the neighbors, and he offers to take all the supplies from Jing Hao. Uncle Yu offers to take all the initiative and lead volunteers who will help him defeat Jing Hao. Many supported Uncle Yu's idea, and they began to offer him various assistance in the form of providing bladed weapons and developing a further plan of action. But despite such a noble attempt to get rid of Jing Hao, there were also those who considered this idea another scam, recalling the recent case of fraud with supplies by Aunt Lin. A very large-scale quarrel arose in the new chat, in which they began to indiscriminately blame each other for everything. Meanwhile, Zhang read all these messages and realized that no other reaction from the residents should have been expected. While eating, Zhang kept thinking that absolutely all the people who accuse each other in this chat without a good reason deserve to die. Meanwhile, Jing Hao and his thugs continued to kill their neighbors in order to take all their supplies. During the robbery, 
One of Jing Hao's subordinates complains of being very tired and offers Jing Hao a snack on some of the supplies he received. Then Jing Hao points the gun at his subordinate and threatens him with serious violence if he continues to whine. The subordinate stopped complaining and continued throwing the corpses of his neighbors into one pile. At this moment, Xing Hao wondered what they would do to him if he did not have a gun, and whether they would listen to him at all. John watched Xing Hao's actions and understood that he was deliberately leaving all the corpses in one place in case there were no supplies left at all and then he would have to eat these same corpses. John also thought that if Xing Hao decided to poke his head into his apartment, this time he would simply kill him with all the thugs. The next day, one of the residents tried to call her neighbors for help to help her escape from Xing Hao. However, despite all her attempts, Xing Hao's people were still able to break through the inner barricade of the apartment and break into it. After that, one of the subordinates grabbed the girl by the legs and dragged her out of the apartment while her neighbors did not stop talking about how this girl fully deserved such a fate. Meanwhile, Yu Qin and her friend thought that if Xing Hao's people began to rob and kill women, then they would soon get to them. Then Yu Qin decides to inform some people that Zhang has supplies so that he can try to break into his apartment with them. A little later, Zhang is again added to a new chat created by Yu Qin, in which she asked Zhang for help. Zhang immediately realized that Yu Qin had already blabbed everything. But at the same time, she forgot to clarify that it was he who was able to injure Zheng Hao. Zhang later sent a message to this chat, saying that he was fine alone, and that if he became bored alone in his apartment, he would definitely report it. In response, chat participants began to write about how selfishly Zhang was behaving, while one psycho broke into other people's apartments and took all the supplies, to which Zhang replied that in this case, the life of each person depends on his personal abilities after which he leaves the chat. They were extremely unhappy that Zhang was behaving like a complete egoist, despite the fact that they had all known each other for a long time. Then they decide to stop trying to negotiate with Zhang in an amicable way and move on to attacking Zhang. One of the guys says that he used to work for a company that specializes in picking locks of any complexity, and he decides to break into the lock of Zhang's apartment, after which they will all get rid of it together. After a couple of minutes, they all waited together for this guy to pick Shang's lock while the others prepared to attack. The girls also held umbrellas in case Zhang decided to splash them with cold water again. Zhang noticed how they were trying to pick his lock, and then he activated the high-voltage flow to the door. After activating the security mechanism in the door, the guy who tried to break into Zhang's door receives a very strong electric shock causing him to fall to the floor unconscious. The electric shock was so powerful that the guy's hands were simply torn off when he tried to pull them out. The guys began to shout condemnation and contempt towards Zhang because they just wanted to peacefully discuss everything with him. But he just kills them. Zhang took out his crossbow and prepared to defend himself so that none of them could continue trying to break into his house. Zhang's door towards one of Yu Qing's partners. Such a shot shot right through his shoulder and the guys decide to stop their hacking attempts and return back to Yu Qing. But after a few seconds, Zhang fired a couple more shots, which wounded a couple more guys. A couple of minutes later, everyone was in Yu Qing's apartment, where one girl was trying to pull the arrows out of the guys. While trying to remove the arrows, the girl noticed that Zhang deliberately used rusty arrows so that they could not pull them out. The guys thought that without medicine, the rusty arrows could cause an infection that could kill them. Then everyone started blaming Yu Qin for not warning anyone that Zhang had a crossbow and that he could fight them back. Yu Qin said that she herself did not know that Zhang might have a crossbow, since the last time he visited her, he did not have any crossbow. Yu Qin's friend tried to explain to everyone that Yu Qin really didn't know anything about Chang being armed. Then the girls decide to ask Dr. Zhou for help and within minutes they had it. Dr. Zhou notices that she is again trying to help a patient who was hit by an arrow, and the girls think that Zhang has already shot someone in this house with a crossbow. Dr. Zhou reassured the girls and told them that they had already had such patients in the hospital. Later, Dr. Zhou tells the girls that without special medical equipment, she will not be able to help the guys. Dr. Zhou also added that without medications and antibiotics, she would not be able to simply pull out the arrow. Dr. Joe said that she had previously seen similar injuries on one of the residents, and she believed that it was definitely the work of Zhang. Yu Qin interrupted Dr. Zhou and said that she herself saw how before the cataclysm Zhang received a very large batch of medicines that could help them. Yu Qin told how, a month before the cataclysm, 
Zhang purchased various supplies almost every day, such as food, water, medicine and other useful items. Dr. Zhou suggested that Zhang knew about the impending danger, and that he must have a lot of supplies, which probably included antibiotics. Zhang for help as soon as possible, completely forgetting about who exactly almost killed them with these arrows. At first, everyone doubted the reliability of such a plan, but Yu Qin said that they would not try to harm Zhang and would even be willing to share their supplies with him. Yu Qing added that this time they would try to reach Shang with kindness, so that he would understand that they are not his enemies and that he has nothing to fear. Then everyone suggests that Yu Qing herself turn to Zhang for help, since it was because of her that they found themselves in this difficult situation, and it was with her that Zhang communicated most often before. One of the guys told Yu Qing that they would all die soon if they didn't work together. Yu Qing then decides to try calling Zhang to try to persuade him to lend her some medicine. Having reached the phone, Yu Qing said that one of her friends was already dead, and the rest were trying with all their might to stay alive. Zhang then asked Yu Qing if they can survive such harsh weather. Since the beginning of the cataclysm, Snowfall has been able to block all entrances to the city, turning it into a kind of island. At this moment, many have already run out of supplies, and even if they do not die from the cold, due to the lack of food, they will all die soon anyway. Yu Qin, without stopping crying, began to ask Zhang for forgiveness, promising to correct herself and not do this again. She reminded him once again that if they didn't take some action, they would all die, and promised that if he gave them some medicine, she wouldn't bother him anymore. Then one of the friends simply snatched Yu Qin's phone and told Zhang that everyone was now in a hopeless situation, and she asked him to put aside his insensitivity and finally help them. Zhang refuted her claims that he was so insensitive, and said that he used rusty arrows and did not kill them precisely so that he could see all the fear on their faces. Such statements frightened her very much, and she believed that Zhang had completely lost his mind. After this, Zhang allowed Yu Qin to come to his house for everything she needed, on the condition that she come alone. Yu Qin was very happy that for the first time in all this time, Zhang would finally let her in, and she promised Zhang that she would do whatever Zhang ordered her to do. When Zhang allowed Yu Qin to come to him, her friend also began to ask him to let her come to him. Then Yu Qin immediately ran towards Zhang's apartment, while her friend tried to stop her. At the same time, Yu Qin tried to break away from her friend, saying that she was tired of living in such conditions. Then her friend slapped Yu Qin in the face and began to talk her out of it, and Zhou Ping did not understand how Yu Qin could so easily ask him after all that he had done for her. Yu Qin replied to Zhou Ping that it was not strange that she finally had the opportunity to escape a harsh death. After this, Yu Qin approached Zhou Ping and told him that he was a good person and that he should let her go if he wished her well. Yu Qin also added that she was very grateful to him for taking care of her and helping her with all his might, but he could not give her as much as Zhang could offer, which made Zhou Ping very upset. Yu Qin's friend kept stopping her, to which Yu Qin said that she had to go. Then everyone else began to speak extremely harshly about Yu Qin's selfishness which made her cry. Dr. Zhou told everyone to stop arguing because they need to think about how they can get the medicine first. Then one of the guys remembered that Zhang had a fireplace, fuel and a bunch of different supplies. And because they cannot cope with Zhang themselves, then they can tell the rest of their neighbors about his supplies, hoping that they will also want to try to break through to Zhang, after which they will be able to divide the supplies equally. Yu Qing was categorically against such a plan, because she just wants to live with Zhang and they want to kill him and steal his supplies. One of her friends wanted to shut up Yu Qing and hit her again, but Zhou Peng stood up to protect her and protect her interests. Zhou Peng said that if he tries hard, Yu Qing will also love him sooner or later. This friend decided not to argue with Zhou Peng once again and decides to begin implementing the previously proposed plan. A few minutes later, this girl posted photos of the food that Chang sent them to the general chat so that the neighbors would understand that he now has a lot of supplies. When Jing Hao saw these photos, he decided that it was time to take revenge on Zhang for everything he did to him. Zhang for help in the general chat, hoping that he would still help them at such a moment, and Su Hao even promised to give him all the shares of his company if Zhang shared it with him. Zhang didn't forget how in his previous life he shared the supplies with everyone and when he asked everyone to share the supplies, they just killed him and tore him into small pieces. Then the people realized that the plan had not worked, and that John was not going to share the supplies with anyone. Neighbors began to insult John and Mass for his indifference, 
calling him a freak and threatening him with retaliatory violence. The neighbor's general anger towards Zhang only grew, but he did not pay attention to all the negativity that was directed at him. Zhang got up from the sofa, looked out the window and thought that he was a little tired of sitting at home. Then he remembers that he also has a pair of snowmobiles with which he can safely leave the apartment and have fun outside. At this moment, Dr. Zhou wrote to Zhang, who directly and without further ado wrote that she had run out of food and medicine. Zhang remembered that the last time Dr. Zhou died was because she gave away her supplies to the needy, and despite such a stern and cold appearance, during the cataclysm she showed her best side, unlike the rest of the residents. Zhang thinks about helping her first, but then he thinks that the smarter a woman is, the easier it will be for her to betray someone. Zhang then writes to Dr. Zhou that he can give her some of his supplies if she gives him something useful. Dr. Zhou asks Zhang for supplies as an advance since she has nothing left. Zhang then invites Dr. Zhou to receive some of his supplies if he fulfills her request. Zhang will give her supplies if she reports to him all the actions of her neighbors. Zhang offered Dr. Zhou two options, betray the villagers and become his ally, or team up with the crowd and try to finish him off. Dr. Zhou decides to join Zhang and report to him everything that the neighbors are going to do, which made Zhang himself very happy. Zhang tells Dr. Zhou to come and exchange with him whenever she has any useful data. At this time, Zhang received a message in which one of Yu Qing's friends kept asking him to share supplies. In response, Zhang simply replied that even if all the neighbors wanted to burn down his apartment, no one would receive his supplies. After such a rude refusal, this guy creates a new group chat in which he was going to discuss with all the neighbors the further plan to seize Dang's apartment. Xun Hao says that he is ready to help his neighbors on the condition that they forget all the murders he and his thugs have previously committed, and that he will take half of all the supplies they find in Zhang's apartment. Uncle Yu and Dr. Zhou were not happy with what they read, and they decide to report everything to Zhang. Dr. Zhou reported everything to Zhang, but he already knew everything and prepared to defend his apartment taking out his entire arsenal of weapons that he only has. Zhang also warned Dr. Zhou not to visit him with the rest of the neighbors under any circumstances. Meanwhile, many neighbors headed to Zhang's apartment, taking with them various bladed weapons such as knives, cutlasses, steel pipes, and aluminum batons. Some hit Zhang's door with all their might. Their efforts were in vain, and the door still did not give in to their blows. Zhang watched as residents tried to break down his door and he decided to shoot an electric charge at the door. After one of the blows, the electric current struck so strongly that it struck not only the one who hit the door, but also the people standing nearby. Such a sight greatly frightened the other residents, and none of them understood how they could break through such a door. One of the neighbors suggested that all the other residents take revenge because Zhang killed several innocent people. Then people decided to use wooden objects so that no one would be electrocuted during the ramming. Several men picked up a large wooden log and began to break down the door to Zhang's apartment. At this time, Zhang was not at all worried that these people would somehow damage his door. Instead of taking any action to stop the neighbors, Zhang decides to drink a glass of cognac and listen to loud music. The neighbors still couldn't stop ramming the door and shouting that Zhang would pay for the death of those he shocked. After a few minutes, the neighbors got very tired and stopped trying to break through the door. One of the neighbors decided to look at the door and tells the neighbors that such a door is usually used in bank safes. He said that such a door cannot be broken even with the help of explosives, and even more so it cannot be broken through with an ordinary wooden log. At this moment, Sham was ready to shoot the man with his crossbow. A moment later, an arrow from a crossbow shot right through the neighbor's throat, from which the neighbors concluded that Zhang had a weapon. The residents were very scared and began to run away from Zhang's apartment. Zhang continued to kill his neighbors with precise hits, which only further instilled fear in the residents. After several shots, several people were left in the corridor, shot through and through who no longer had any chance of further survival. Then the residents thought that trying to break through the door was useless, and they decided to try to break through the wall itself. Several people began banging on the walls with all their might, hoping to successfully break into Zhang's apartment. However, after a few minutes of trying to break through the wall, the residents noticed that the walls were also made of the same steel as the door. Despite this, People continued to try to break into Zhang's apartment using various tools. Zhang tells his neighbors that his walls are lined with super strong alloy, 20 centimeters wide, that can't penetrate anything. Zhang looked at everything that was happening outside and thought that if his neighbors continued to try to break into his apartment, 
they would soon become exhausted. At this point, neighbors recalled how, a few weeks before the disaster, John completely renovated his apartment. Then one of the neighbors said that John knew in advance that the whole world would be subjected to a severe snowstorm, and that John deliberately decided to protect himself and his apartment, and not warn others. The neighbors were furious that John had not warned the others about the onset of the snowstorm, and that he had deliberately chosen not to tell anyone so as to remain the only person alive. Xing Hao then told the neighbors that even if the walls of Zhang's apartment were protected, they might try to break through his walls and ceiling. John Hao then divided the people into groups and sent them to certain apartments to break through the floor and ceiling of Zhang's apartment. Several people went to the required apartments and for several minutes tried to break through the floor and ceiling in these apartments in order to create a hole on the other side through which they would get into Zhang's apartment. Zhang heard his neighbors knocking on the ceiling and floor and thought that Jing Hao was a little smarter than he thought but the neighbors still wouldn't be able to get into his apartment. When the neighbors finally managed to break through the floors and ceilings of the apartments, they discovered that behind them was the same heavy-duty alloy plate that lined the interior walls of Zhang's apartment. The neighbors were shocked that Zhang's entire apartment was lined with heavy-duty alloy, thereby resembling a large impenetrable box. As the neighbors tried to break into Zhang's apartment from all sides, many of them began to lose their strength and their desire to eat increased by the second. People were so tired while they were trying to break through the floor and ceiling of Zhang that despite the very low temperature, many of them became hot, and only this could warm them up a little. Many began to become hysterical and shout at Zhang that he was a selfish person who had no intention of helping his neighbors. Yu Qin's friend suggested that the neighbors get into Zhang's apartment through the balcony through which they could easily get into Zhang's apartment. Then the rest of the neighbors thought that they should have tried to get onto Zhang's balcony from the very beginning, since there should no longer be any protective cladding there, and then they could easily break into his house. A couple of minutes later, the neighbors laid a board to Zhang's balcony, along which a small group of them took turns walking to Zhang's balcony. Even though Zhang's neighbors were getting closer and closer to him, he didn't even get up from the couch and continued drinking his morning coffee. Within minutes, an angry crowd stood on Zhang's balcony and tried to break through the armored glass, and even so, Zhang was still not afraid. Every minute the number of neighbors on Zhang's balcony became more and more, and every minute they broke into Zhang's apartment more and more. A few minutes later, Zhang got up from the sofa, took out a bottle of flammable liquid and set it on fire. After that, Zhang went to the wall and threw the bottle into a special compartment through which the bottle with liquid should end up on the balcony. Less than a second later, the neighbors on the balcony saw this bottle falling on them. In an instant, the bottle fell on one of the neighbors, and he immediately burst into flames. While this neighbor was burning, he experienced severe pain and at one point he simply fell out of the balcony several floors down. Zhang did not stop sending bottles of liquid onto the balcony, and after just a few seconds, all the neighbors who were on the balcony began to burn alive. Zhang watched with all pleasure as the neighbors, who a minute ago wanted to kill him, began to beg him for mercy. John still refused to let the neighbors into his house, so they decided to try to go back to where they came from. Out of fear, the people who remained in the neighboring apartment were afraid that people were walking towards them, burning alive. When the burning people began to come closer, one of Eugene's friends tried to disperse the burning neighbors approaching them. During such self-defense attempts, many of the burning people fell from the board down several tens of meters. After a few seconds, the remaining burning people stopped showing any signs of life and then the people remaining in the neighboring apartment brought up several burning corpses in order to somehow warm up. After a while, the corpses stopped burning and turned into pieces of ice, and then the next group of people went to Zhang's balcony. Unlike the previous group of neighbors, this group came to Zhang's balcony without weapons, and people from this group without aggression began to beg Zhang to give them at least some food. However, such actions still did not evoke any compassion or pity from Zhang and he simply continued to eat the noodles he had prepared earlier and look at these people. Back then, people kept begging Zhang to share food with them and said that they would do anything to get some food. Zhang thought that he could now easily manipulate these people based on their hunger, and he decided to give these people a chance. Then Zhang went to the balcony and said that he would give instant noodles for a week to the person who brought him Jing Hao's head. The group of people who were on Shang's balcony looked at the crowds of Jing Hao's people and felt that if they did not want to starve to death, then they had no choice but to finish off Xing Hao. Then this group of people headed towards Xing Hao to kill him, 
but his thugs tried to hold these people back. While Jing Hao and his thugs were fighting off people who wanted to kill them, Jing Hao noticed that in the general chat Sean left a new message in which he wrote that he would feed instant noodles for a week to anyone who brought him Jing Hao's head. Jing Hao realized that Zhang was trying to set as many of the remaining people against him as possible, and he was trying to return home from the balcony of a nearby building as soon as possible to think through his further plan of action. The next day, the group of people Zhang spoke to were looking out for the corridor to wait for the moment when Jing Hao would appear so they could surprise him and finish him off. A few minutes later, Jing Hao walked out into the corridor to go outside and get rid of the ice that had accumulated there, which was preventing them from going outside normally. A group of people waited for the most opportune moment to attack Jing Hao, and after a couple of seconds, they attacked Jing Hao from behind. However, Jing Hao manages to react in time and shoot those people who tried to attack him. Jing Hao's thugs took the bodies of the traitors to the corpse storage area thinking that he would do the same to anyone who wished him dead and tried to kill him. However, despite the unsuccessful attempt of these people to deal with Jing Hao, one of them still managed to leave a serious deep wound on Jing Hao's back. One of Jing Hao's thugs took him to one of the apartments, while Jing Hao himself was going to call Dr. Zhou to bandage his wound. Half an hour later, Dr. Zhou arrived at Jing Hao's apartment, and when she finished bandaging the wound, she demanded that Xing Hao repay her for the work she had done. Xing Hao offered Dr. Zhou to pay with meat from the corpses of her neighbors, and Dr. Zhou immediately refused such payment, and said that she would rather die than stoop to cannibalism. Then Xing Hao said that he did not want to allow the only doctor in the entire house to suddenly die. Xing Hao also added that Dr. Zhou had nothing to worry about, because if he had to sacrifice one of the residents— he would leave Dr. Zhou as the last survivor, but Dr. Zhou himself did not like Xing Hao's current behavior. As Dr. Zhou was about to leave, Xing Hao pulled out a gun and said that he could not allow the doctor to leave before his wound had fully recovered. After this, Xing Hao began to discuss with his thugs their further plan of action. At one point, Xing Hao offers to leave this apartment and settle in a neighboring apartment and wait for the moment when Zhang leaves his apartment and Dr. Zhou decided to inform Zhang about this. Dr. Zhou went to the bathroom to write to Zhang that Xing Hao was going to move in as close to him as possible in order to catch the moment he left the apartment, and Zhang asked her to continue to monitor the situation and inform him of their further actions. Less than an hour later, Xing Hao and his thugs broke into the apartment where Yu Qin's friend lived with her friend. When Yu Qin's friend and her friend left the apartment, they were not very upset because they had a small supply of food with them. A few seconds after Yu Qin's friend and her friend left the apartment, two thugs immediately knocked them out with a strong blow to the head. Yu Qin's friend and her friend right in front of Dr. Zhou, which made her terrified. Xing Hao told Dr. Zhou that he couldn't just let them go, since they needed to replenish their supply of human meat so as not to starve or freeze. While in the apartment of one of Zhou Peng's friends, one of the guys felt unwell from unbearable pain in the shoulder area. When he took off his clothes to look at his wound, he saw the huge infection he had left from the last time Zhang hit him with a rusty nail. The rest of the guys, including Zhou Peng himself, also had such large wounds that became infected, and none of them had any idea what to do next. Out of a sense of inevitability, Zhou Peng tried to persuade his friend Yu Qin to make another attempt to talk to him, to which she, out of reluctance to talk to Zhang, replied that they should stick together. After a couple of days, Zhang decides to watch through the cameras what actions Jing Hao and his thugs are trying to take next. Zhang saw Jing Hao threatening neighbors and robbing their houses, after which he killed some people. Despite all his influence in this situation, Jing Hao was afraid that the number of cartridges in his pistol was becoming less and less, and that their supplies of human meat were starting to run out and therefore he had to kill more and more people from time to time in order not to starve to death. Zhang looked at everything that was happening to Jing Hao and thought that Jing Hao was just an ordinary coward who intimidates people so that they do not even try to give him some kind of rebuff and resist his actions. At that moment, someone called Zhang, and it turned out to be Dr. Zhou. Dr. Zhou said that all of Jing Hao's thugs just started going crazy and that they were starting to rob and kill people. What scared Dr. Zhou most was that the thugs deliberately hunted down other people, killed them and used the flesh of the corpses as food, which made her feel very bad just thinking about it. Dr. Zhou also said that she was dying of hunger because she had not eaten anything for two days, and she wanted to ask Zhang for help. Zhang felt that he should not allow Dr. Zhou to die, 
since in the current situation it is very difficult to find a good doctor. Zhang also believed that he should not miss this opportunity to teach Xing Hao a lesson. Zhang then told Dr. Zhou that he could help her if she did one task for him. At this moment, Zhou Peng began knocking on Zhang's door, who had been trying to attract Zhang's attention for a long time. Zhang walked to the door and asked Zhou Peng if he was fine now with such a large wound. Zhang told Zhou Peng that he now had a very large wound and if any infection or any other microorganism got into it, Zhou Peng would die in the next few days. Zhang also said that Zhou Peng's wound was now in such a serious condition that no medicine would help him in this situation, which scared Zhou Peng very much, and he began to shout at Zhang even louder. Then Zhang invites Zhou Peng to do something that he had not yet decided to do, and Zhou Peng completely agreed with Zhang's words. Then Zhou Peng calmed down, and headed towards the apartment where Yu Qing was now sitting. A minute later, Zhou Peng entered Yu Qing's apartment and knelt down in front of her in a critical condition. Then Zhou Peng did what he was afraid to do in recent years. He proposed to Yu Qing, but she refused him. Yu Qing was angry with Zhou Peng because he, like the last selfish person, proposed to her when the whole world was collapsing and people were dying every minute. Zhou Peng told Yu Qing that he would soon die, that very soon they would both end up in hell and that they would always be together. Yu Qing was frightened by this behavior and the unpleasant smell from Zhou Peng, which is why she slapped him hard. In response, Zhou Peng began to strangle Yu Qing while she accused him of being such a useless loser. At this moment, Dr. Zhou couldn't stop thinking about the risks that could happen to her, even though she promised Zhang that she would help him. At one point, Dr. Zhou noticed how one of the thugs was preparing soup from human meat and she told Jing Hao that she would go help with the cooking. Jing Hao was pleasantly surprised that Dr. Zhou was able to finally decide to do this, while she was still disgusted by the thought of cannibalism. Then Dr. Zhou told Jing Hao that she simply didn't want to die, and that's why she had to do this. After that, Dr. Zhou pretended for a while that she was helping in the kitchen, preparing firewood. A few minutes later, the thug who was preparing the soup asked Dr. Zhou to oversee the cooking for a while while he left for other matters. Xing Hao and his goon to sleep for a while. A few minutes later, Dr. Zhou brought Xing Hao and smashed him one bowl at a time of human meat soup. When everyone started eating, Dr. Zhou said that she would go eat in the other room. However, no one paid much attention to Dr. Zhou anymore and everyone was happy to eat soup. After that, Dr. Zhou went into another room and waited for her sleeping pills to take effect, which should take effect in the near future for at least half an hour. A couple of minutes after everyone had eaten the soup, Xing Hao and his thug began to feel a little sleepy. Within a minute, Xing Hao and absolutely all of his goons fell asleep, and Dr. Zhou was going to ask Zhang what to do next. When Dr. Zhou confronted Zhang about her actions, Zhang told her that she should drag everyone she had euthanized to the balcony. A few minutes later, Dr. Zhou dragged Jing Hao and smashed everyone onto the balcony. After this, Dr. Zhou wanted to find out from Zhang what he wanted to do with them all. Zhang threw a rope to Dr. Zhou and said that he wanted her to kill them. Zhang told Dr. Zhou that she must find Jing Hao's gun and tie him up and thug him. After that, Dr. Zhou tied Jing Hao and his thugs tightly after which she took Xing Hao's gun. When Dr. Zhou took out Xing Hao's gun, Zhang told her to remove the magazine from the gun and throw it all to him, after which she could go. Zhang's actions and asked him why she should listen to him, to which Zhang replied that she simply had no other choice. Then Dr. Zhou, without thinking twice, unloaded Xing Hao's pistol and threw it with its magazine towards Zhang. When Zhang caught Xing Hao's gun, he thought that this gun was very similar to the one he had seen from Jing Hao before. After that, Zhang went back home for some reason, which made Dr. Zhou a little interested. A minute later, Zhang returned to the balcony with a long hose, from which a strong stream of water came out, which he directed at Jing Hao. Dr. Zhou looked at all this and thought that Zhang was a real man-man, since he decided to kill Jing Hao and smashed him with hypothermia. Jing Hao was horrified when he woke up and saw him sitting on the balcony tied up and completely wet. A couple of seconds later, the thugs Jing Hao, who were also horrified by what was happening. After this, Jing Hao noticed Zhang spraying him and his charges with water from a hose. When Zhang noticed that Jing Hao and his thugs had woken up, he increased the water pressure in the hose so that they would get as wet as possible. After a few seconds, Zhang decided to stop splashing water at Xing Hao so as not to waste his water reserves. A couple of minutes later, Xing Hao and his thugs froze to death, and then Zhang called Dr. Zhou. Zhang told Dr. Zhou that she had proven her loyalty to him, 
after which he told Dr. Zhou to go to his apartment right now. A couple of minutes later, Zhang saw through the cameras that Dr. Zhou was already standing near his door. Zhang stood near the door with a gun in his hands in case Dr. Zhou was about to attack her, after which he allowed her to enter. After this, Dr. Zhou slowly entered Zhang's apartment, after which she immediately took off her cloak. Dr. Zhou immediately felt good from the feeling of warmth which she had not experienced since the very beginning of the cataclysm. After this, Zhang began to examine Dr. Zhang for any dangerous objects that could easily kill a person. Zhang told Dr. Zhou that since he allowed her to live in his apartment, she must prove to him that she poses no threat to him. A few minutes later, Dr. Zhou stood in front of Zhang in her underwear, after which Zhang was completely convinced that she was not a threat to him. Zhang then handed Dr. Zhou a towel so that she could wash herself in his bathroom in peace. Zhang took Dr. Zhou to the bathroom and told her that he had prepared clean clothes for her that should fit her. While Dr. Zhou was taking a bath, Zhang searched her pockets for various useful items, among which he was able to find several medications. A few minutes later, Dr. Zhou came out of the bathroom wearing clothes that Zhang had prepared for her which were ideal for her both visually and in size. Zhang then sat Dr. Zhou on the sofa to dry her hair with a hairdryer. While Zhang was drying Dr. Zhou's hair, he began to list the rules for her living in this house, and if she disobeys Zhang even once, he will not spare her. Zhang also indicated to her which room she would live in, and that there were security cameras throughout the house, and the walls and door were made of impenetrable steel and Dr. Zhou should only leave the apartment with Zhang's permission. Dr. Zhou listened carefully to everything Zhang told her, and she said that she was ready to follow all his instructions. After this, Zhang was going to tell Dr. Zhou his secret, which he had never told anyone before. Zhang told Dr. Zhou that keeping secrets was a major step in strengthening their mutual cooperation. Zhang said that the first thing he wanted to do was kill those who tried to kill him first. Zhang told Dr. Zhou that this whole cataclysm occurred after an unknown cosmic ejection, which, as it turned out, caused not only climatic changes, but also biological ones, thereby changing the internal structure of some people from which many of them received incredible superpowers. After that, Zhang had food in his hand, which he took out from his pocket space, thereby demonstrating his ability to Dr. Zhou. Zhang handed the food to Dr. Zhou and said that all the food that was currently in the house was only a small part of how many supplies were stored in his pocket space, which would definitely disappear if he suddenly died. Dr. Zhou looked at the food she received from Zhang and thought that he really had superpowers after which Zhang finally allowed her to eat the food she received. Then Dr. Zhou, without any thought, tore off the packaging and began greedily eating what Zhang gave her. As Dr. Zhou washed down the food she had just eaten, Zhang told her that despite such a favor as helping to kill Jing Hao, she still had not fully gained his trust. Zhang also told Dr. Zhou that since the sewage system had stopped working long ago, she would now be responsible for the bathroom. After this, Zhang asked Dr. Zhou what lengths she was willing to go to in order to continue living in warmth and comfort during the cataclysm. Dr. Zhou understood what Zhang was getting at, after which she began to undress, and she and Zhang moved into the bedroom. The next day, Zhang woke up before Dr. Zhou and had already prepared breakfast for the two. When Zhang prepared breakfast, he woke up Dr. Zhou, after which she got dressed and went to the living room to have breakfast. During the meal, Zhang slowly ate his food while Dr. Zhou ate her entire breakfast very quickly and greedily. After breakfast, Zhang asked Dr. Zhou if she was full, to which she replied that she was not full and could eat much more, but due to the risk of causing gastroenteritis, she decided to stop. After breakfast, Zhang handed Dr. Zhou her cloak so she could put it on and go outside with it. After that, Zhang took a bat with him, went out onto the balcony with Dr. Zhou, and told her that they would now get some ice. Zhang handed the baseball bat to Dr. Zhou and ordered it to break the frozen corpses of Jing Hao and his thugs. Zhang said that even in this state, he was disgusted to look at these corpses and that he wanted to get rid of them. When Dr. Zhou went outside, Zhang said that he wanted to show the rest of the neighbors that it was dangerous to mess with him. Dr. Zhou had no choice but to follow all Zhang's orders in order to continue to live with him in warmth and comfort. After Dr. Zhou moved to the neighboring balcony, on which were the frozen corpses of Jing Hao and his thugs, she immediately began to smash the frozen bodies to smithereens. While Dr. Zhou was breaking the frozen corpses, Zhang was filming everything that was happening. At first, Dr. Zhou was not happy that Zhang started filming, 
but he said that it was necessary to show all the neighbors that Jing Hao and his thugs were dead. Then Dr. Zhou stopped arguing with Zhang and continued to break the frozen corpses. When Dr. Zhou smashed all the corpses on the balcony, Zhang immediately uploaded a video of her to the neighbor's general chat. The neighbors watched the video and were incredibly happy that Zhang finally managed to deal with Jing Hao and his thugs once and for all. After this, Zhang sent a voice message to the general neighbor chat, in which he told the neighbors that now, after the death of Jing Hao and his charges, the entire building was under his complete control. Zhang read the chat messages and saw how neighbors began to praise Zhang for finally freeing them from Jing Hao's merciless tyranny and those people who had run out of supplies would not stop begging Zhang to share food. While Zhang was reading all these messages, Yu Qin called him, and Zhang was a little surprised by the fact that she was still alive, so he answered the call. Yu Qin asked him if she could now go live with him, since he had dealt with Zheng Hao. Zhang asked Yu Qin how she was still alive, and Yu Qin believed that Zhang was worried about her, and that he stopped writing to her thinking that she was already dead. Yu Qin tearfully begged Zhang to kick Dr. Zhou out and let her go live in his apartment with the pretext that they would definitely live happily together. During the call, Zhang heard Yu Qin's friends attack her, saying that she deserved to die, and then the call was interrupted. Dr. Zhou pressed herself against Zhang's shoulder and said that she was not at all as selfish as Yu Qin. Then Zhang thought that if he sent Yu Qin a photo of himself with Dr. Zhou, Yu Qing would simply go crazy. While Yu Qing is fighting with her friends, a new message from Zhang arrives on her phone. Yu Qing stopped fighting with her friends and grabbed her phone and saw a message that included a photo of Zhang and Dr. Zhou sitting together and hugging each other. Yu Qing immediately became hysterical and began trying to convince Zhang that he could not do this to her. However, Zhang said that he and Dr. Zhou are happy with each other, and he is not going to give up on her for Yu Qing and that there is no point in keeping in touch with Yu Qing. Yu Qing was very upset because Zhang used to chase her for two years, but now he lives happily with another girl. Yu Qing began to blame Dr. Zhou, and instead of words of support, her friends began to laugh at her and say that she more than deserved such an outcome. After this, Zhang felt that there was no point in continuing his communication with Yu Qing, after which he blocked her. After this, Zhang decided to ask Dr. Zhou if she thought he was some kind of cruel person after this act. However, Dr. Zhou told Zhang that she did not consider him cruel and thought that Zhang probably had reasons for doing this. Zhang was pleased that Dr. Zhou understood the entire motive behind all his actions. After a while, Dr. Zhou prepared lunch and called Zhang to the table. However, Zhang decided to snack on an ordinary apple and read messages in the general chat in which Aunt Lin wrote that if the neighbors did not listen to her, she would turn to her relatives at the police, and after the storm ended, the police would let everyone be massacred. Dr. Zhou thought that Zhang was afraid that she wanted to poison him, and at this moment Zhang did not understand how Aunt Lin survived after Jing Hao attacked her and her grandson first. Dr. Zhou said that when she came to examine Aunt Lin's grandson, she felt sorry for both of them and gave them some of her supplies. Immediately after this, Dr. Zhou began to make excuses by saying that at that time everything was still just beginning, and she could not know how circumstances might develop further. Then Zhang said that the fact is that most likely Aunt Lin and her grandson had long since eaten the supplies they received, and he did not understand how they were still alive. Dr. Zhou said that Aunt Lin's grandson died a week and a half ago due to lack of medicine so she might as well eat her grandson's supplies to survive. At one point, Dr. Zhou noticed a man fall out of one of the windows of a nearby building. This man turned out to be Zhou Ping, who had completely lost his mind and decided to end his torment. Dr. Zhou asked Zhang when this storm would end, to which Zhang replied that he did not know, and they could only wait. After that, Zhang received a call from Uncle Yu and Zhang answered the phone without any hesitation. Zhang immediately said that Uncle Yu could throw away all politeness and directly say what he needed, and he would be happy to help. Uncle Yu was one of the few good people who could potentially be useful to him. Uncle Yu said that Li Mei's daughter had a high fever, and that they had run out of medicine, and they were very worried about the baby's further condition. Zhang thought to himself that Uncle Yu was a single man, and Li Mei had a good figure. So Uncle Yu decided to take care of her and her daughter. Zhang said that he had the right medicines and Uncle Yu could come to him and take them, for which Uncle Yu himself was very grateful. Zhang also said that Uncle Yu could calmly turn to him for help at any time, since Uncle Yu was even closer to Zhang than his own uncle. When Zhang ended the call and hung up, 
He thought that Li Mei was not as simple a girl as she might seem at first glance, and that Uncle Yu was the only person who listened to Zhang and prepared a certain amount of supplies in advance, and therefore he was the most suitable option for Li Mei and her child. Dr. Zhou was curious about how close Zhang was with Uncle Yu, to which Zhang said that in such a situation, one must constantly think about gaining personal gain. Zhang said that Uncle Yu is a good person, and if he helps him, then Uncle Yu can help him one day. Zhang also said that he does not want Uncle Yu to remain in a hopeless situation and become the same as his neighbors, since during the cataclysm there were very few good people left like Uncle Yu. A few minutes later, Uncle Yu finally came to Zhang to get medicine for the child. However, Zhang noticed that Li Mei and her child also came with Uncle Yu, which Zhang did not expect at all. Uncle Yu said that he came while Li Mei asked Zhang to help her and her child. After a couple of seconds, Zhang walked to the door, threw the baby's medicine into the hallway, and asked Uncle Yu and Li Mei to go home. Uncle Yu thanked Zhang for his help and was about to leave, but Li Mei asked Zhang if he could keep her child with him for a while, since it was too cold in their apartment. Zhang thought that Li Mei had gone too far, because he thought that if he took the child in, then the mother would beg to let her in. John then said that he could not take the child in because he had almost run out of fuel to keep the house warm, and therefore the temperature in his house was equal to the temperature outside. Uncle Yu told Li Mei that John had already done everything he could for them, after which he suggested returning home as soon as possible. But Li Mei began to cry and said that the man was unlikely to understand her concern for the child. Then Li Mei continued to beg John to take the child to live with her, at least for a short time. John then said that most people in this building wanted him dead, so he couldn't risk her child's life like that. Zhang's words, telling Li Mei that he had already helped them a lot by giving them medicines, which are now very difficult to get in such a situation. Li Mei asked Zhang why he allowed Dr. Zhou to live with him, to which Zhang replied that they were dating. Dr. Zhou heard what Zhang said about them just now and thought that even if he just said it like that, she was still very pleased to hear it. Uncle Yu told Li Mei to return home as quickly as possible, telling her that Zhang had already helped them a lot. Uncle Yu held Li Mei and the child close to him, and told Zhang that he had helped them a lot, and asked Zhang not to pay attention to Li Mei's behavior, to which Zhang replied that he understood well how much she worried about her child. After Uncle Yu and Li Mei left, Zhang returned to Dr. Zhou with the thought of how unbearable this woman was. Dr. Zhou said that there are many women in the world now who are worried about their children, to which Zhang replied that he should under no circumstances break off such a relationship with Uncle Yu. When Uncle Yu and Li Mei came home, Li Ye put her daughter to bed, after which Uncle Yu began to express his dissatisfaction with her regarding her behavior today. Li Mei began to justify herself by saying that she was doing all this for the sake of her daughter so that she could live in more pleasant conditions. Uncle Yu told Li Mei that he understood that she was worried about her daughter's life, but he also told her that any form of kindness comes with a price sooner or later. Uncle Yu also said that if Zhang had not warned him about the impending threat, he would have died long ago, and then Li Mei would not have been able to live with him with her daughter. Li Mei then told Uncle Yu that she actually doubted that Zhang deserved such praise at all due to his excessive vigilance. These words made Uncle Yu very angry to which Li Mei said that John simply did not want to help them, while simply devaluing his help with the medicine. Li Mei also said that John uses such petty help in order to later use Uncle Yu, since she believed that if John was a good person, he would not be so cruel to the dozens of people who died because of him. After that, Li Mei started talking about how Zhang's apartment was big enough for them to live with him, but Uncle Yu was already so angry with Li Mei that he simply interrupted her and told her to shut her mouth. Uncle Yu told Li Mei not to say such words about Zhang anymore, since Uncle Yu himself was still able to distinguish between good and evil. After this, Li Mei's child began to cry, and Li Mei herself apologized to him, and said that she was just worried about Uncle Yu. Unwilling to continue talking to Li Mei, Uncle Yu said that he would sleep in the living room tonight, after which he left the bedroom. Li Mei thought that she could not allow her and her daughter to continue to live in the conditions in which they were living now and she promised her daughter that they would definitely live in Zhang's apartment. The next day, a group of former construction workers dug their way into the building where Zhang lived with Dr. Zhou. Seeing one of the residents in the corridor, they immediately chased after him to neutralize him. The team of workers decided not to do anything with the dead resident for now, and everyone decided to leave the corpse in this place until they finished their business here. A few minutes later, 
A group of workers climbed to the twenty-fourth floor and reached the apartment where Shang and Dr. Zhou lived. When the workers reached the door to Shang's apartment, one of the workers prepared explosives to blow down Zhang's door. When the explosives were ready, one of the workers immediately began to run away from it so that the explosion would not hit him. When the explosives exploded under Zhang's door, there was a very loud sound that woke Zhang up. Zhang took the gun and checked the CCTV cameras to check the condition of the apartment, and all the walls of the apartment, and the door were able to withstand such a powerful explosion. After that, Zhang saw through surveillance cameras how a group of construction workers managed to get into the building. Zhang saw various construction tools in the hands of the builders, such as shovels, rebar, and axes. Zhang recalled that shortly before the cataclysm in a neighboring house, someone hired a group of workers to carry out another renovation of the building. Then Zhang made the logical conclusion that since these builders came to him, then they knew about him far beyond the boundaries of this building. After such a powerful explosion, a group of construction workers were surprised that the door to Dang's apartment could withstand such a powerful explosion. Then the builders believed that during the time it took them to get to this building along the street, the explosive device simply became damp and therefore became less powerful. Zhang walked to the door and prepared to use a special chemical solution that was as destructive as standard construction explosives. When Zhang prepared his special solution, he threw it with a flammable liquid into the corridor. When the construction workers saw a flammable liquid with a chemical solution flying towards them, they immediately began to run away from Zhang's apartment. However, the destructive power of the chemical solution paired with a flammable liquid was so enormous that all the builders began to burn alive at one point. A group of construction workers tried to leave this floor as quickly as possible, while they could still escape. However, Zhang managed to get a pistol and, in turn, shoot through the door at each builder that the cartridges could reach. The builders were confused due to a lack of understanding of where the shots were coming from and from which side. While the construction workers tried to leave the floor as quickly as possible, Zhang continued to shoot each construction worker. Within a few seconds, half of all the construction workers who had made their way into the building were lying on the floor in the corridor with burnt skin and bullet holes in their heads. Zhang thought that he had been lucky and that he had not bought an assault rifle since the spread of bullets from an assault rifle would have been too large to be as effective as possible in killing those trying to break in on him. John also thought that the street cold was able to neutralize most of the potentially dangerous people, and now only the most brutal enemies could survive, and therefore John needed to figure out how to get rid of them as quickly as possible. Besides, John was also surprised by how well these construction workers prepared before breaking into his home. After John managed to fight off the builders, he went to calm down Dr. Zhou, who was very scared. When Zhang took off Dr. Zhou's blanket, he saw how scared she was that she almost cried from fear. Dr. Zhou immediately calmed down and said that she thought there was an earthquake, so she decided to hide, and Zhang told her that even if there was an earthquake, they would still be crushed. When Dr. Zhou finally calmed down, she sat next to Zhang and asked him what really happened after which Zhang told her everything. When Zhang told Dr. Zhou everything, she said that these builders were even more dangerous than Jing Hao and his charges. Then Zhang said that without any weapons these people did not pose any threat to them, and that in order not to die during the cataclysm, people who were strangers to each other began to gather together, thereby forming peculiar families or flocks. But despite this, Zhang was glad that he was once again able to protect himself from a potential threat. Then Dr. Zhou said that they must definitely take revenge on them for this, and Zhang completely agreed with this idea. But they had to take revenge not only for themselves, but also for the rest of the residents. After this, Zhang noticed how neighbors in the general chat began to worry about the sounds of explosions and gunshots, and Zhang wrote that a group of workers broke into their house to rob and kill them but fortunately he managed to fight them off and neutralize most of them builders. Then the neighbors began writing words of gratitude to Zhang in the general chat, and said that as long as Zhang was with them, they were not afraid of any outside threat. However, Zhang also informed all his neighbors in the general chat that his ammunition was running low, and therefore now everyone must ensure their own protection from a potential threat. After that, Zhang received a call from Uncle Yu again who was worried about Zhang and began asking him if he was okay now, after which he said that Uncle Yu used to get along well with these guys, and he couldn't even imagine that they were capable of this. Zhang then said that he was fine now, but that he did not have a plan for further defense yet. Zhang also asked Uncle Yu to tell him everything he knew about these people, 
and then he could develop his further plan of action. John told Uncle Yu that he wanted to join forces to deal with the threat as quickly and effectively as possible. At first, Uncle Yu suggested writing about the idea in the general group to find volunteers, but John said that this was not necessary, since it would only make people more doubtful of his efforts. John said that these builders would probably return to him to take revenge, and sooner or later the neighbors themselves would want to resort to Zhang for help and this plan suited Uncle Yu quite well. After this, Zhang ended his conversation with Uncle Yu and made a request to Dr. Zhou. Zhang said that due to the personal hatred of some neighbors towards him, he cannot do some things on his own, and so he asks Dr. Zhou to collect various information about these builders with Uncle Yu for him to get rid of them as soon as possible. A few days later, Dr. Zhou, dressed as a maid, collected all the information she and Uncle Yu could get for Zhang. Dr. Zhou reported to Zhang that a group of construction workers had arrived from Building 26 and were heavily armed, with some of the construction workers even carrying firearms. In addition to the builders, the threat was also posed by two leaders from Building 21, and these were Wang Qian and Xiao Lu, and they formed their own gang which included mainly young and motivated guys. Zhang also learned that in the remaining residential buildings, most of the residents died either from the severe cold, exhaustion from lack of supplies, or they committed suicide. Zhang told Dr. Zhou that they needed to continue to collect various information about any potential threat in order to minimize all risks. Meanwhile, a group of construction workers continued to break into residents' houses, kill them and rob them in the hope of finding at least some supplies. The neighbors began to become very worried that the construction workers might break into their apartments and kill them, and they believed that John was the one to blame for everything that was happening, and therefore he should surrender to the construction workers. John and Dr. Zhou came out of the shower. John picked up the phone and realized that the neighbors reacted to what was happening faster than he himself expected. John wrote in the general chat that if his neighbors cannot protect themselves from this danger, then it is their own fault, and that he does not intend to give up in any way. John was very disappointed by the behavior of those neighbors who still continued to blame John for being the only one among all the people who was safe. Then the neighbors said that at any moment these construction workers could come to their home and kill them to which Zhang said that he could potentially also kill every person in this building, which scared the neighbors very much. People began to worry that since the death of Zhang Hao, they were still not without some kind of danger in the person of Zhang. Then people hoped that the snow would soon melt, otherwise they would all die soon. At this point, Zhang called Uncle Yu and told him that it was time for them to begin implementing their common plan. Uncle Yu said that he was ready to execute after which he proceeded to carry out the plan. Uncle Yu wrote in the general chat that if everyone united, they could easily resist the enemies, after which Uncle Yu wrote that due to the fact that many people did not have supplies left, some people would not be able to provide adequate resistance, and he suggested turning to Zhang so that he would lead all his neighbors. Uncle Yu said that he would personally try to convince Zhang to help the neighbors. After this, Uncle Yu personally wrote to Zhang, and Zhang said that everything was going according to plan and when the time came, the neighbors themselves would join him, and together they could save the building. After that, Zhang called all his neighbors in the general chat and said that he was ready to offer them his help, and he was ready to listen to any suggestions on how they could deal with the threat. The neighbors said that as long as Zhang did not allow them to die, they were ready to follow his instructions. Zhang then asked the neighbors if they were willing to arm themselves and oppose the gang if he ordered them to do so, and then the neighbors doubted their choice. John then assumed that his neighbors wanted him to go against the gang alone, and then there was no point in him going and saving them. John also said that otherwise the neighbors might just sit and await their fate. Then Uncle Yu entered the conversation and said that he was ready to put in his efforts to stay alive, after which he asked the neighbors why they wanted to just sit on the sidelines and not take any action. John then said that from now on, all neighbors must obey him and follow all his instructions and if someone does not make an effort, then no one will receive any help from Zhang, after which he ended his call. After this, in the general chat, neighbors began to write en masse that they were ready to listen to Zhang's instructions and carry them out. Zhang also wrote that he would give out part of his supplies to those who would still join him and listen to him. Meanwhile, Zhang felt that he definitely needed to make sure whether someone was capable of fighting and therefore he had to make sure to get out to get supplies and weapons. Then John considered that the best option for freely moving along the snowy street would be to use a snowmobile, 
which is now in his pocket. John thought that it was thanks to the snowmobile that he could easily cover long distances on a snowy street in a minimum amount of time. Then the neighbors wanted to know from John whether he could even go out and get the necessary amount of supplies to supply all the residents of the building with them. John wrote in the general chat that he worked in a warehouse for several years, worked in a warehouse, and therefore he knows several where the warehouses are located, which may contain some supplies. At this moment, Aunt Lynn was only thinking that because of her position as a manager, she would sooner or later be forced to bear responsibility for each resident. After that, most of the neighbors said that they would definitely make every effort to stay alive. Dr. Zhou was very glad that the neighbors sided with Zhang, but Zhang himself said that for him, all these neighbors were just cannon fodder, which would sooner or later be spent. However, Dr. Zhou still wondered whether Zhang was really going to go outside. Zhang told Dr. Zhou that he just needed the right opportunity to go outside. Zhang also noted that in any case, he and Dr. Zhou will have more than enough supplies that they have now. At first, Dr. Zhou said that she would go with Zhang, but he was categorically against Dr. Zhou going out with him. Zhang felt that Dr. Zhou thought that Zhang did not trust her enough. Zhang then told Dr. Zhou that they were in a relationship and that he trusted her completely, after which he began to leave the apartment. When Zhang left the apartment, Dr. Zhou was still upset that Zhang did not allow her to go with him. A few minutes later, Zhang went down to the fourth floor and saw that all the walls and floor were stained with blood. Without leaving the fourth floor, Zhang opened the window, climbed through it, and found himself on the street. It was very difficult for Zhang to walk through such snow the height of which could reach the fourth floor. Then Zhang decided to look around to make sure that no one could see him. After making sure that no one would see Zhang, he pulled out a snowmobile from his pocket dimension, which was already fueled and ready for use and which he had hidden before the cataclysm began. However, someone still managed to see Zhang leaving the building on a snowmobile. While Zhang was riding a snowmobile, he was haunted by the thought that someone had finally noticed him driving down the street on a snowmobile. John thought about how long it had been since he went outside, and now he had the perfect opportunity to ride his snowmobile with the wind. A few minutes later, John was able to reach the Tianhai police station. John, without any hesitation, broke one of the windows of the police station and went inside. Once inside, John saw several policemen lying frozen to death in one of the corners. John believed that when the cataclysm began, these police officers remained on night duty, which is why they stayed here and waited for their death. After this, John covered several police bodies with a towel, thereby expressing all his respect for those who defended this city before the cataclysm began. While John was covering the policemen's bodies with towels, he noticed something shiny on one of the policemen. This shiny thing turned out to be a bunch of keys among which there were probably keys to the armory. John began to look from this bunch of keys that should open the doors of the armory for him. After a couple of minutes, John was able to find the armory and open it to find as many useful weapons as possible. John was delighted when he saw among the entire arsenal he saw various armor, machine guns, shotguns, pistols, explosives, and even a sniper rifle. John was very pleased that in addition to firearms, there were also ammunition and special equipment. John held the rifle in his hands and thought about how his firearm accuracy had become much better recently. After Zhang had seen enough of the entire arsenal of weapons and equipment, he immediately placed all the weapons and equipment into his pocket space. After Zhang took all the weapons and equipment, he went to one of the suburban supermarkets to get food, which he would give to his neighbors for their defense. After a few minutes of driving, John arrived at the place where one of the suburban supermarkets was supposed to be located. Having found one of the windows of the supermarket among a pile of snow, John broke it and made his way inside, climbing down the rope. John walked through the department with expensive clothes. He thought about how such clothes, which he could not afford before, turned into ordinary and unnecessary garbage. However, John still transferred all the clothes to his pocket dimension, after which he went to the floor below simultaneously collecting things that might also be useful to him. A minute later, Jean went down to the floor below, where one of the grocery stores was located. Most of the products that were in the store had already become unfit for consumption. However, Jean did not care how spoiled the food he would give to his neighbors, and he began to collect all the food that caught his eye. A couple of hours later, Jean returned back to the building with a supply of weapons and food which he would give to his neighbors for a successful defense. Several people from the construction gang noticed Zhang arriving home on a snowmobile, and they thought that if they could take Shang's snowmobile for themselves, 
they could easily move around the city. Then several people from the construction gang began to develop a plan on how they could get rid of Zhang. Uncle Yu went down to meet Zhang and said that Zhang had indeed prepared well for this cataclysm. Zhang led into the building through the window and told Uncle Yu that in such conditions it was extremely difficult to find any supplies and he could not find anything. Zhang took out a couple of bags of supplies and told all the assembled neighbors that he had spent a lot of time and effort getting supplies for his neighbors. Dr. Zhou then took one of the bags and emptied the contents to show the neighbors how much food Zhang had managed to get. People saw how many products Zhang was able to get for them, and they began to praise Zhang for his help. Zhang told his neighbors that even though he had gotten all this food for them, he also clarified that he was not going to feed people who didn't do anything about it. At this moment, armed construction workers began to make their way towards the building, who were going to take all the food Zhang had obtained for themselves. Zhang pointed out the crowd of construction workers to his neighbors and said that the more construction workers his neighbors could defeat, the more food they would get. The neighbors immediately ran to attack the builders, expecting to get as much food as possible after the battle. At this moment, the builders were very frightened by how the residents were boldly running to attack them. A few seconds later, a fierce battle began between the residents of the house and the builders. Zhang and Dr. Zhou watched as their starving neighbors brutally killed more construction workers every second. Meanwhile, the number of neighbors who went into battle against the builders became more and more. After a couple of minutes of such a brutal and unequal battle, the gang of builders decided to retreat and flee. All the neighbors were very happy that this time they were able to fight off the gang of builders with their own efforts. Meanwhile, Dr. Zhou looked at the bodies of her wounded neighbors, and she wanted to do her best to help them get back on their feet. However, Dr. Zhou was confident that Zhang would not allow her to waste her medicine supplies on these people. A few minutes later, Zhang gathered all the neighbors in the corridor on the first floor of the building to inform them of the successful defense of the building. Zhang told his neighbors that it was because they were all able to muster up the courage and put in the effort that they not only survived, but were also able to fight back the enemy on their own. After this, Zhang called to him a couple of men who were able to kill the most enemies. When the men approached Zhang, he gave them several foodstuffs for the greatest contribution to the defense of their building. The men were incredibly happy that they had finally received their food supplies and said that now they would put even more effort into ensuring the safety of the entire house. John looked at the crowd of neighbors and said that it was precisely because of the feeling of unprecedented hunger that these people went to the defense. After this, John called the rest of his neighbors who were in battle to give them as much food as they deserved for the battle. The neighbors lined up and Zhang gave each neighbor as much food as each neighbor received for his work. Now every resident of this house received food if he worked well, and if someone did not make any effort then that person was left without food. Zhang wanted to give the food to the next neighbor, but one of the residents started shouting to Zhang where his food was. Then Zhang looked at this man and threw one ordinary candy at his feet. This man began to resent Zhang for giving him one measly piece of candy out of all the food. Zhang said he personally saw the man stand at the very end and cover himself with the other neighbors, who began to fight back. Zhang also told this person that he only gave him this candy because Zhang was kind today thereby shaming this man in front of the rest of the neighbors. Then this resident began to make excuses by saying that the other neighbors dealt with the builders too quickly, and therefore he was not to blame for the fact that he did not have time to defeat anyone. But Zhang replied that the result of the battle was important to him, not its process. Then this resident became indignant and said that Zhang was too prejudiced towards him. Then Zhang invited this villager to talk about how fairly he was treating him and then Zhang called over a couple of young guys who also participated in the battle. These two young guys pushed the disgruntled neighbor to the floor, and Zhang told him that he gives orders to everyone and everyone must follow these orders, otherwise he will punish those who do not follow these orders. Zhang then pointed a gun at the disgruntled resident, and said that anyone who did not follow his orders would get what they deserved. Zhang also pointed to the door, and said that anyone who is not going to listen to him can safely leave this house at their own risk. Then this disgruntled resident called Zhang a liar, to which Zhang kicked him in the palm, from which the candy fell out. Zhang took the candy from the disgruntled tenant, and told him that he would expect him to be more obedient next time. Zhang let the disgruntled resident go, and told the rest of the neighbors that they didn't want anyone who would behave like that. When Zhang distributed his food to all his neighbors, he decided to put the remaining food aside for storage. However, women's voices were heard from the crowd, 
shouting that they had not received anything. These girls turned out to be Yuchin and her friend, who begged Zhang to share food with them. Zhang leaned over to the girls and said that he remembered them and said that he couldn't do without them. At first, the girls really didn't like how Zhang dared to single them out from everyone else. Then the naive Yuchin, with tears in her eyes, decided to remind Zhang how he had previously told her that he loved her more than anything in the world. Zhang hit Yuqing in the face with a gun and told her that he used to love her, but she never took his feelings seriously. Zhang also said that Yuqing used to just use him as an errand boy, and Zhang added that he already has a girlfriend. Dr. Zhou clung to Zhang and he said that Dr. Zhou is tens of thousands of times better and so he asked Yu Qin not to bother the two of them anymore. Yu Qin then began to cry even more and scream about how Zhang had previously asked her to live with him, while the rest of the neighbors began to call her a shameless girl. Zhang then asked the previously disgruntled villager from whom he had taken the candy what the other villagers called Yu Qin. Previously, a disgruntled resident said that all the neighbors called Yu Qin words such as universal socket bus and other expressions denoting her poor social responsibility. Then the neighbors began to laugh at Yu Qing, which made her cry even more. Unable to withstand such strong pressure from her neighbors, Yu Qing simply ran away from the corridor. Then Zhang again gave the previously disgruntled man another candy, and this time he thanked Zhang for his kindness and said that from now on he would try his best for the good of the house. Yu Qing asked friend out of the corridor, who also did not receive any food. After Zhang rid himself of Yu Qing and her friend, he began to develop a plan to fortify the entire building. Zhang counted all the neighbors and found out that among all the neighbors, excluding children, there were 47 people left in the building. Zhang proposed creating several groups of seven people, and each group would be on duty at a certain time and place, while he, Dr. Zhou, Uncle Yu and Li Mei would perform other duties. Zhang also ordered that they knock on the staircase railings in case any group discovered that someone was approaching the house. Besides, Zhang also clarified that he will now give food to those residents who can neutralize five or more enemies. And while on duty, each group will only eat what they have. After this, Zhang puts Uncle Yu in charge of each group, and Uncle Yu said that he would handle this responsibility. A couple of hours later, Zhang and Dr. Zhou were already sitting in their apartment and Dr. Zhou asked Zhang what the situation was like outside. Zhang was reviewing his combat arsenal and said that the cataclysm completely covered houses with a small number of floors with snow. Zhang also noted that even if the snowfall subsides, it will take at least two weeks for all the snow to melt. However, Zhang said that a large amount of snow was not a problem for them, after which he took out from his pocket dimension the entire arsenal of weapons that he had obtained at the police station. Zhang told Dr. Zhou that no matter what danger they were in, they were not in any danger. Zhang picked up a sniper rifle from the floor and noted that the biggest danger for them at the moment was the people they might encounter sooner or later. After this, Zhang went out onto the balcony to check the functionality of his sniper rifle. Through the scope of the sniper rifle, Zhang saw that there was someone on the street. After waiting a little, Zhang saw the man approaching the garage where the snowmobile was supposed to be located. Zhang looked at this man and thought that his bait worked well, and when this man was inside the garage, he would have one unpleasant surprise. At this moment, Zhang received a call from Uncle Yu, who wanted to thank him for providing the noodles. Uncle Yu also wanted to apologize to Zhang for Li Mei's words, justifying it by saying that she has a boneless tongue. Zhang decided to ask Uncle Yu why he was ready to raise someone else's child in such conditions to which Uncle Yu said that it didn't matter now, and that he could find such a good girl as Li Mei. John told Uncle Yu that he completely underestimated himself and his capabilities, telling him that a person like Uncle Yu was simply a real treasure. John also noticed to Uncle Yu that it was good that his fate had worked out so well, since he would not have to think about wedding expenses and other things that young couples puzzle over. Uncle Yu said that they had enough to worry about with Li Mei's child for now, after which he once again thanked Zhang for the help she provided. Finally, Zhang told Uncle Yu that he respected both him and Li Mei equally, and he hoped that they would be happy with each other, and on such a pleasant note, the conversation between Zhang and Uncle Yu was completed. After the call, Zhang told Dr. Zhou that such matters should never be rushed, and she completely agreed with this. A few hours later, a group of construction workers broke into the building again again trying to rob the residents for supplies. While a group of construction workers was walking along the landing, a brick began to fall on one of the construction workers in front. However, 
The builder manages to dodge the brick in time and survive. Then one of the residents continued to throw bricks at the uninvited guests and call the other residents for help. Then a group of builders were surprised at how carefully the residents prepared for their arrival, and then they decided to kill all the residents who caught their eye. Less than a minute later, a fierce battle between residents and builders began on the landing. However, this time too, the group of builders suffered heavy losses of their fighters, who could not withstand the entire defensive force of the residents of this building. Then one of the commanders-in-chief of the construction group ordered everyone to leave the building as soon as possible, thereby trying to avoid further losses. When a group of construction workers left the building, one of the residents offered to catch up with them, but everyone decided that it would be better to stay in the building since it was too dangerous outside. John looked from the balcony at the group of retreating construction workers and thought about how a group of crazy hungry adult men attacked them again and were defeated again. At one point, John wondered if he would be able to hit at least one of them with a sniper rifle. Then John took out a sniper rifle from his pocket space, loaded it with ammunition, and prepared to fire a couple of accurate shots with it. During this time, a group of builders managed to run away from the building at a fairly large distance. But despite this, Zhang, using a very powerful sight, noticed them and aimed as accurately as possible. Zhang pulled the trigger and in an instant was able to neutralize one of the construction workers with a precise hit to the head. The construction workers immediately stopped and began looking for the place where the shot came from. Zhang was very pleased that he was so easily able to neutralize one of the builders at such a great distance. Zhang then decides to fire a few more shots and finish off a few more construction workers. This time Zhang again managed to finish off one of the builders with one precise shot to the head. With every second, the number of corpses of construction workers from Zhang's shots became more and more. After several shots, Zhang decided to stop firing, since he had already been able to neutralize a considerable number of enemies. At this moment, Zhang thought that now he wouldn't even have to go outside to get rid of the intruders and keep this building safe. Some neighbors were frightened by the sounds of gunfire, and they immediately realized that it was Zhang and they were very surprised at how Zhang managed to get rid of several construction workers at once with such ease. Zhang thought about how much the sounds of his gunfire had alarmed the neighbors, and he believed that now many of them would not be able to sleep peacefully tonight. The next morning, Dr. Zhou prepared breakfast and asked Zhang not to criticize her cooking skills too harshly since she was not a very good cook. Zhang told Dr. Zhou that she had enough time to practice cooking a little, because if they ate the same thing, they might get tired of it sooner or later. During breakfast, Dr. Zhou asked Zhang about the shots she heard that night, and Zhang told her straight out that he had killed seven construction workers with a sniper rifle who had tried to attack and rob the residents yesterday. In response, Dr. Zhou simply said how amazing Zhang was, and Zhang asked her if she would be interested in learning more. Dr. Zhou simply replied that it did not matter since she was completely confident that Zhang was doing everything correctly. Zhang was very pleased that Dr. Zhou never showed any unnecessary curiosity. Meanwhile, one of the leaders of the 26th building looked at the dead bodies of those construction workers whom Zhang was able to shoot at night. At this moment, one of the residents reported to his boss that most of the people were either dead or missing. Dang's overnight shelling began to think about how they could get their hands on Zhang's snowmobile since it would be the only way they could replenish their supplies. Wei, who was one of the most influential people in the 26th building, be brought to him this evening. Meanwhile, John was about to go outside again to look for any warehouses or stores that might still have supplies left. Now all the residents of this building clearly understood that if they want to stay alive, now they must not only listen to Zhang's instructions, but also not provoke him into aggression. While riding the snowmobile, Zhang called Uncle Yu and asked him to monitor the entire building while he was away. Meanwhile, a group of bandits from the 21st building saw Zhang leaving the building on his snowmobile from the windows. The bandits looked at Zhang and couldn't stop thinking about where he might be hiding his snowmobile, and one of the bandits said that the area was big enough that Zhang could find some secret place. The bandits believed that if they managed to get this snowmobile, they would soon be able to solve not only the shortage problem, but also the problem of the lack of people in their gang. One of the bandits especially wanted to get this snowmobile so that he could travel between stores without any problems and pick up cigarettes from there without any problems. For a couple of hours, John rode a snowmobile around the snowy city and tried to find some other large warehouse or store from where he could get more supplies. John later remembered the main warehouse at the southern base, 
which was very difficult to reach on his own, and Zhang figured that there must be some supplies there. A few minutes later, Zhang arrived at one of the city's largest main warehouses, from which all products were already being redirected to other city warehouses. Zhang could feed thousands of people with it, and he immediately tried to get into it. However, Zhang noticed that someone had already taken all the light products, but he still went down there to see what could be left there. Going downstairs, Zhang saw in front of him a bunch of expensive business class cars and various sports cars, and Zhang decided to take all these cars into his pocket space, just in case. After a couple of minutes, Zhang took everything that was left from the warehouse, and he decided to go back up. Climbing back through the roof of the warehouse onto the street, Zhang believed that his fuel reserves were already running low due to the snowmobile. Then Zhang got behind a snowmobile and began looking throughout the city for gas stations that might have at least some fuel left. A few minutes later, Zhang arrived at one of the gas stations, and as it turned out, there was almost no fuel left at this station. Zhang fell into the snow and could not believe that he would still have to save on fuel. Zhang lay in the snow and thought that if there was a small group of people here, it would be easy to dig an entrance. At one point, it dawned on Zhang that he really should excavate to the gas station. At that moment, Zhang stood up and took out an excavator from his pocket space, which he had hidden there before the cataclysm began. After that, Zhang refueled the excavator and got into it to try to dig through to the entrance to the gas station. Fortunately for Zhang, he had already operated similar equipment while working in a warehouse, and if during this time the snow had not become very icy, he could easily dig out all the snow at the gas station. When the excavator's engine was able to warm up a little, Zhang immediately began digging out all the snow that had accumulated around the gas station. After a few minutes, Zhang managed to dig through all the snow that was in his way, and he immediately decided to go inside as soon as possible. Zhang did when he went inside was to believe that all the fuel should be stored at the very bottom and he decided to go down to test his theory. Zhang found one of the doors that led to the gas station basement, and he immediately decided to try to break it. After a couple of seconds, Zhang managed to open the door and decided to go downstairs to check if there were any fuel reserves below. Once at the bottom, Zhang saw several tanks of fuel that would last him for the rest of his life. After this, Zhang decided to see how much fuel was left in these tanks. At one point, Zhang thought that since he ended up here so easily, it turns out that now all these fuel reserves belong to him. At this moment, Zhang was incredibly glad that now all the benefits of civilization, which remained under a thick layer of snow and which no one else would receive so easily, now belonged only to him. After a few hours, Zhang was able to move all the fuel and food supplies into his pocket space. After that, Zhang set up a tent at the gas station and decided to take a break today and tomorrow he will go to the place that Uncle Yu told him about. Meanwhile, Dr. Zhou came to Li Mei and Uncle Yu's home to check on their baby's condition. Even though Zhang left some food for the neighbors, he still took away all the medicine, and Dr. Zhou had a hard time treating the child. At that moment, Uncle Yu appeared and brought Dr. Zhou some medicine to try to cure the child. Li Mei was worried about her child's condition, and Uncle Yu tried to reassure her that everything would be fine when Zhang returned home. Li Mei thanked Dr. Zhou and Uncle Yu for making her child's conditions slightly better. Dr. Zhou told Li Mei that if Zhang had not provided them with medicine, it would have been much more difficult to cure the child, and therefore Zhang should be thanked. After this, Dr. Zhou and Uncle Yu went further to discuss with each other some issues related to the distribution of supplies between neighbors. At this moment, Dr. Zhou noticed that someone very quickly began to walk down the stairs towards Li Mei. It was Aunt Lin who was holding a knife and screaming that her grandson died because of them. Aunt Lin plunges a knife into Li Mei's neck, and in pain she accidentally drops her baby. However, Dr. Zhou manages to catch the child, and Li Mei asks Dr. Zhou to take the child and escape from here as soon as possible. Aunt Lin then cut Li Mei's neck, pointed her knife at Dr. Zhou, and demanded that the child be given to her. Dr. Zhou completely refused to give the child to Aunt Lin, to which she said that since her grandson was dead, then this child should not remain alive either. Zhang's apartment as soon as possible to hide from the distraught Aunt Lin. However, Aunt Lin manages to catch up with Dr. Zhou and knock her down, after which she said that Dr. Zhou must pay for the fact that she could not save her grandson. Having lost all hope of salvation, Dr. Zhou covered the child with her body while Aunt Lin was about to stab Dr. Zhou and the child to death. However, at that moment Uncle Yu appeared, 
who managed to stop the crazy Aunt Lin and snatched the knife from her hands. After this, Uncle Yu asked Dr. Zhou if they were okay, to which Dr. Zhou said that she and the child were fine, but Li Mei did not survive the attack. Dr. Zhou said that it was entirely her fault, since she did not expect that Aunt Lin would be able to go without food for so long. At this moment, Aunt Lin came to her senses and began blaming Dr. Zhou for the death of her grandson. Aunt Lin began to shout louder and louder every second to the whole house that everyone was to blame for the death of her grandson, and that everyone must die. Uncle Yu could not stand it, and told Aunt Lin to shut up right now, since it was Zhang who saved them all from Jing Hao, who had kept all the residents in fear for a long time and she should be grateful to Zhang. Dr. Zhou also told Aunt Lin that Zhang was not to blame for not giving her the medicine. However, Aunt Lin continued to claim that her grandson died precisely because Zhang refused to help her. Dr. Zhou said that she managed to persuade Zhang to provide her with medicine for Auntie Lin's grandson. But when she came to her, her grandson had already been killed by her. However, Aunt Lin continued to claim that she did not kill her grandson and that they were the ones who killed him. The two guys looked at Aunt Lin and told her with condemnation that she dared to torture her grandson and ultimately kill him. Then one of the guys said that he was very surprised how this old woman remained alive after everything that she had done during the cataclysm. At this moment, the other guy took out a lighter from his pocket and said that he had not eaten for several days, while Aunt Lin looked quite fat and well-fed. The next morning, Zhang woke up, crawled out of his tent, and was ready to head to the place Uncle Yu had told him about. John left the gas station and headed to the place that Uncle Yu told him about, which should have a lot of different ammunition. When John arrived at this place, he noticed that there was also a lot of snow here, and he decided to use the excavator again. After a few minutes, John was able to dig an entrance, after which he entered the building. When John entered the building, he saw that the place looked very secure, and he didn't understand why there was no one here. While examining all the rooms, John could not find a single person, and this scared him a little. John then suggested that the people who were here had left here earlier, and that they might have known about the beginning of the cataclysm in advance, as a result of which these people took all the ammunition from here. In this case, these people could hide somewhere to wait out this cataclysm, after which they could re-establish their old world order in the new world. After inspecting the building from the inside, John went back outside and thought that armed people could become the most serious problem for him that he would have a hard time dealing with. After that, John got into the excavator and after a few minutes began to break through one of the walls on the other side of the building. After a couple of minutes, John managed to break through the wall of the building to find himself in one of the rooms that he could not enter from inside the building. After passing through the wall, Zhang saw a room in front of him that was completely filled with various ammunition. Zhang was very happy about such a large find, since among various pistols, machine guns, shotguns and cartridges for them, he found a lot of sniper rifles and even grenades. A couple of minutes later, Zhang took absolutely all the weapons and ammunition, along with explosive devices. After that, Zhang got on the snowmobile and went home, thinking that if he ran out of ammunition, he would definitely need to find some places like this. A couple of hours later, John returned home and told his neighbors that he had carefully looked in a bunch of different places, but had not been able to find anything useful, and that next time he would try to look in other places. The neighbors were extremely unhappy that they would have to go hungry again until John went outside again. John could not help but notice the outright dissatisfaction on the part of his neighbors, and he decided to remind them who saved them from certain death. John said that so little time has passed, and his neighbors have already become so angry, and when the situation improves, he will stop helping them, and everyone will get their own food. One of the neighbors told John that he had simply misunderstood them, and that they were well aware of how difficult it was to find supplies in such harsh conditions. After this, John prepared to return to his apartment and told his neighbors that they were all free for the day. Many people looked at Zhang and thought that he was treating them like cattle while they risked their lives together. One of the neighbors, holding a knife behind his back, invited Zhang to go outside with him in a small group. Zhang's snowmobile could fit two more people. Several people supported this idea and said that they would be willing to help Zhang find supplies. Zhang understood what these guys wanted to do, after which he took out a gun, and immediately shot one of the neighbors right in front of everyone. John said that he did not believe a single word they said, and he decided to remind them of their unquestioning submission. When John pointed the gun at the other neighbors, 
they began talking about how they actually wanted to offer him help. Then John said that if he did not kill these guys who had just offered him their help, then other people would not understand that it was best for them not to get in his way. After several shots, John got rid of those guys who also wanted to get rid of Zhang. After the shootout, Dr. Zhou and Uncle Yu came to Zhang to ask Zhang if he was okay. Zhang said he was fine and only got away with a couple of scratches. Zhang also said that he had always been a good person, and that he would simply forgive the other neighbors for their failed attempt at rebellion. On the way to his apartment, Zhang thought that he could do with a little cleaning up of the cannon fodder that the neighbors were. Returning home, Zhang decided to first ask Dr. Zhou what had happened in the house during his absence. Dr. Zhou told Zhang a recent case in which Aunt Lin killed Li Mei, and she was killed the next day, and Zhang said that out of all the neighbors, she was the first one who deserved death the most. Dr. Zhou also told Zhang about a man from the ninth building who would like to hold peace negotiations with him. However, Zhang did not fully understand what this person wanted to talk to him about. Dr. Zhou said she did not know all the details, and that the man wanted to personally discuss future collaboration with Zhang. However, Zhang said that he did not need anything from this person, and that in any case these people could only wait for their death. Dr. Zhou felt that she should tell these people that Zhang was not going to talk to him. However, Zhang said that he first wanted Dr. Zhou to tell him everything about these people so that he could better understand who he would have to negotiate with. Chen Lin Yu headed one of the largest cosmetics companies, which was worth more than $200 million but it was later revealed that the entire company was one large financial pyramid. Chen Lin was in good shape despite her age, and she had approximately ten survivors from the ninth building under her command. Dr. Zhou also added that Chen Lin is in charge of the entire ninth building. Zhang thought that under such conditions, even a woman was capable of some kind of leadership, and he knew that this woman was not so simple. After this, Dr. Zhou asked Zhang if he had decided to meet with Chen Lin after all. Zhang said that the first thing he needed to do was scout out the general situation in order to better understand what this woman wanted to achieve from him. After this, Zhang saw messages on his phone about Chen Lin and a certain Li Zan being added to friends, and Zhang thought that he had met this person before. Zhang accepted the applications, and at that very moment Chen Lin wrote to him to discuss their joint collaboration. Chen Lin offered to call. But Zhang wrote that if she had something to say, then let her say it directly and without any extra words. Chen Lin felt that Zhang was a very tough person and that utmost care should be taken with him. Chen Lin has heard about Zhang, that he has killed a lot of people, and that he has a snowmobile and a sniper rifle, and therefore she needs to choose the best words in her dialogue with Zhang to increase her chances of making a successful deal. Chen Lin wrote to Zhang that she had admired him for a long time and she would like to cooperate with a person like Zhang. Zhang thought that Chen Lin was very assertive when she wrote that if he and his snowmobile helped her and her people in sorties, she would provide him with labor. Later, Chen Lin reminded Zhang that his people were extremely negative against him, and as long as he helped her and her people with getting supplies, they would remain neutral. Zhang assumed that Chen Lin was trying to threaten him, and he decided to ask her directly. Chen Lin replied to Zhang that in this situation— the best option for both of them is to cooperate together. Then Zhang told Chen Lin that it was the first time he had seen such a confident and purposeful person, after which he said that he would definitely think about her proposal and answer her. Zhang looked out the window at the ninth building and thought sarcastically that if these people and his neighbors really turned against him, then he would not be able to do anything about it. Zhang then thought about what chances he would have against these people if they all attacked him. Zhang believed that these people would not be able to demolish the building with their bare hands, and due to the lack of fuel and electricity, they would not be able to use any heavy equipment. Zhang tried to understand what consequences might await him if he continued to stand firm in his opinion. Zhang didn't want to risk having to kill thousands of innocent people. While Zhang was thinking about his next steps, he received a new message from Li Jian on his phone. Li Jian immediately wrote to Zhang saying that he would like to cooperate with Zhang on mutually beneficial terms. Li Jian wrote to Zhang that in the 18th building, where he was in charge, there was a very well-coordinated team, and he was ready to provide Zhang with labor and other resources in exchange for food. Zhang felt that Li Jian was a very talented executive who could extract maximum profit for himself at minimal cost and Zhang asked Dr. Zhou if she knew anything about Li Jian and the 18th building. Dr. Zhou said that she heard from some neighbors that Li Jian was a very charismatic person, 
and almost everyone in that building is still alive thanks to the close-knit team and even distribution of supplies among the residents. Zhang felt that Li Jian was a very good leader, however, he believed that this was not enough to survive under such conditions, after which he wrote to Li Jian that he would consider his proposal. After this, Li Jian sent Zhang a list of his demands and conditions, which did not seem so difficult to Zhang. Zhang hugged Dr. Zhou and told her that he could either start a war between the buildings or come to a truce and general cooperation. While Zhang offered his options for the outcome of events, Dr. Zhou thought that she was very lucky that Zhang liked her, since it seemed to her that something was wrong in Zhang's head. At one point, Zhang asked Dr. Zhou what he should do best, and this scared her very much. Dr. Zhou said with trembling legs that if Zhang started a war— he would waste a large amount of valuable ammunition, and if he gave food to the residents of another building, it would be a waste of resources. Feeling panicked, Dr. Sho offered Zhang the option of moving out of the building. Zhang said it was a good idea, but he couldn't create the same bunker anywhere else. As night approached, Zhang asked Dr. Zhou to cut the body armor into several pieces of fabric to later make into regular clothing. Meanwhile, Zhang wrote in the general neighborhood chat that people from other buildings wanted to attack them and take away all their supplies. After this, neighbors wrote that they could not allow this to happen and that they needed to prepare and fight back. Zhang also suggested that the neighbors divide all the supplies and hide some of them in case people from other buildings still managed to appropriate some of the supplies. At that moment, Zhang received a message on his phone about entering into a conversation with the managers of residential buildings. Zhang accepted the invitation to join a group with the managers of residential buildings and someone immediately began to list to Zhang the terms of their overall cooperation. Among the conditions, the residential building managers specified that in exchange for personal safety, Zhang must provide them with some of his supplies and his snowmobile. Zhang, of course, did not want to agree to such conditions, and he felt that it would be much easier for him to get rid of the residents of other residential buildings and their managers. Then at one point Zhang was struck by the idea that he could simply drive all these people into a trap. The next day, Zhang armed himself with a melee weapon and gathered outside to prepare for a possible attack from residents of other buildings. Zhang understood that these apartment building leaders were only hiding behind the idea of peace negotiations in order to find out about Zhang's entire combat readiness, and Zhang wanted to surround these people and get rid of them as effectively as possible. Zhang planned to throw a grenade towards the surrounded and trapped people in order to get rid of as many people as possible at once. And even if Zhang did not manage to hit all the attackers with the explosion, then in any case no one else would dare to attack him. Zhang took some more defense items with him and got ready to go outside. Meanwhile, Uncle Yu was distributing food to the neighbors that Zhang had given him in order to feed the residents a little before the battle. The neighbors ate their food and thought that they had done the right thing by choosing to listen to Zhang's instructions. When Zhang found himself among the neighbors— they began to ask him about the outcome of the negotiations and whether they could return to normal life after everything they had been through. John told his neighbors that if the negotiations were successful, residents would no longer have to worry about food shortages or constant attacks from residents in other homes. John with hope for a bright future and thought that this whole nightmare would soon end. People followed John with the hope of victory, but Zhang himself understood that today not everyone would return alive. A couple of minutes later, John went outside with his neighbors to prepare for defense. However, as soon as John and his group went outside, they immediately noticed groups of residents of other buildings approaching them. John didn't expect that residents from other houses would come here so soon, and the neighbors didn't know what to do in this situation. John to his group of residents so that they returned back as soon as possible. After this, John called Uncle Yu and told him that too many enemies had come, so he needed reinforcements. After this, John took cover in the snow, took out a sniper rifle and prepared to defend himself against potential enemies. The rest of the group of residents began to suspect that these residents from other buildings clearly did not come here for negotiations. Uncle Yu then told the residents that they had nothing to worry about since John must have had some kind of plan. One of the neighbors drew Uncle Yu's attention to the fact that there are too many of these people, to which Uncle Yu said that their main task is not residents and Zhang. In front of the residence stood the managers of the residential buildings, among whom were Li Jian, Chen Lin Yu, Wang Qian, 
Qin Yin Yang and Tian Fan. Zhang looked at Qin Lin and wondered if they could handle the ambush he had set for them. Zhang also thought that he must under no circumstances allow these residential building managers to attack first. Yun Yang drew the attention of the other residential building managers to the fact that their tenants would be enough to kill all the tenants of Deng's building and they felt that Zhang was afraid to negotiate. Chen Lin told the other managers of the residential buildings that they should not rush to conclusions, and they should first discuss everything and discuss the terms of further cooperation with Zhang. Yun Yang then shouted to Zhang's neighbors that they had come here to hold general negotiations. Uncle Yu noted that the composition of the residential building leaders was different from the one Zhang had agreed to negotiate with to which Yun Yang said that they had decided that it would not be practical for the full complement of residential building leaders to come. Uncle Yu then told the managers of the residential buildings that only five people could enter, and that they must undergo a search, while the rest of the people should move away. Yun Yang felt that John was too bold a man since he ordered a search of the managers of residential buildings and at the same time dared to set forth his terms of negotiations. John overheard the entire conversation of the leaders through Uncle Yu's phone and thought that these people decided to threaten him. At this moment, John began a dialogue with Uncle Yu, to which Yun Yang said that they came here to negotiate, and therefore they did not intend to wait so long for him. Uncle Yu said that he understood everything after which he asked all the leaders to move away a little. The management of the residential building did not understand why they had to move away, but they did not argue and decided to move away from Shang's neighbors. Zhang observed the situation from the sight of a sniper rifle and waited for the moment, when the managers of residential buildings and their residents moved away at a sufficient distance. When the leaders of the residential buildings were far enough away, Zhang gave Uncle Yu a whistle signal. After that, Zhang took out a grenade, pulled the pin out of it, and threw it towards the residents of other buildings. A couple of seconds later the grenade reached the residents of other buildings, and people began to panic incredibly. However, despite attempts to escape, no one managed to escape from the grenade, and a second later an explosion occurred. A crater formed at the site of the explosion, next to which lay the bodies of a couple of dozen wounded or dead people. After the explosion, Uncle Yu took out his phone and called Zhang, and Zhang asked the apartment building managers how many people were left. Yun Yang told Zhang that they came here solely to conduct mutually beneficial negotiations together. Zhang then asked the managers of the residential buildings for what purpose they brought their people here. Zhang also added that these people would be a hindrance to their negotiations, and so he got rid of some people. Chen Lin interrupted Zhang and said that they came here to improve relations between the managers of residential buildings. After this, Zanger told the managers of the residential buildings that he was expecting them in five minutes on the 30th floor in one of the apartments for negotiations. John looked at the rest of the people below and thought that he would have to get rid of them anyway, but it would not be easy for him to get rid of all the people at once. John then prepared a meeting space by placing a table and several chairs in the center of one of the apartments. After five minutes, the managers of residential buildings tired of climbing the stairs, entered the apartment. One of the residential building managers introduced himself to John and asked him to start negotiations as soon as possible. Having sat down at the negotiating table, the managers of the residential buildings told John that a critical situation had arisen, during which many resources and supplies were no longer enough for normal life. Also, the managers of the residential buildings said that due to the lack of food and other resources, their residents are slowly dying from cold and hunger, and therefore they would like to negotiate, hoping that Zhang will provide them with the necessary resources under certain conditions. Zhang stopped listening to the complaints of the apartment building managers, and after a few seconds, he took out a gun and put it on the table. The managers of the residential buildings were very scared at the sight of the firearms in Zhang's hands and they said that they wanted to resolve all issues peacefully. Zhang said that the residential building managers had no reason to be afraid because the gun began to bother him, so he took it out of his pocket. Zhang then tried to calm down the residential building managers and asked them to sit down. Zhang told the executives of the residential buildings that he was not at all comfortable with the fact that he had to unwisely distribute his supplies between the executives and their residents. Zhang also told the managers of the residential buildings that he knew that they were doing their best to take care of their residents even when such harsh conditions began. After this, Zhang said that he would offer his conditions— 
and if at least someone did not agree to fulfill these conditions, he would start a large-scale war between residential buildings. Yang's first condition was that he was ready to provide the managers of residential buildings and their residents with food, but in the most reasonable quantities, and they should decide for themselves how to distribute supplies among the residents. Zhang said that he could provide food for a maximum of 300 people, but Chen Lin did not agree with such conditions. Chen Lin said her building house is about a hundred people, and she has no idea how she will distribute supplies among her residents. John said that there was no point in this idle chatter, and so he wanted to proceed with his next terms. However, one of the leaders said that they really needed to discuss the supply of supplies again. Yun Yang said that this would indeed not be enough to feed all of its residents. Zhang began loading his pistol and asked the apartment building managers if it would be easy for him to provide food for 300 people every day. Frightened, Li Jian suggested dropping the question and moving on to Zhang's next condition. Zhang wanted to clarify with the residence managers what they would do in exchange for providing supplies. Zhang then took out a handful of seeds from his pocket and said that if they wanted to survive and provide themselves with food, they would have to grow plant food. However, residential building managers looked at this handful of seeds and did not understand how they were supposed to grow food in such conditions. One of the residential building managers began to complain about the conditions of growing food, and John said that sooner or later the food and fuel supplies may run out, and if they want to survive, they will have to look for alternative solutions to the problem. Zhang also told the managers of residential buildings that if they send workers from their buildings every day and this produces results, then he will provide them with all the necessary resources. Zhang said that if they succeeded, he would give them cigarettes, alcohol, clothes and medicine, and this greatly interested the two residential building managers. Then one of the executives asked Zhang to give him at least one cigarette as soon as possible. Zhang took out a pack of cigarettes from his pocket and gave one cigarette each to the two residential building managers who smoked. While the smoking managers of the residential buildings were leisurely and happily finishing their cigarettes, Zhang decided to ask them if they agreed to follow all his instructions and if they were ready to follow all the specified conditions. Li Jian wanted to speak out about the conditions, but the smoking managers of the residential buildings interrupted him and said that they were ready to do anything as long as they were given cigarettes. Then the smoking managers of residential buildings said that they would comply with all the instructions if each of them received two packs of cigarettes every day. However, Shang said that he was willing to give each of them no more than one pack per day, and they both agreed. Zhang told the other residential building managers that he was very happy that they were able to reach a compromise. However, the managers of the residential buildings realized that they were unable to obtain from Zhang the conditions that they had originally presented to him. Wang Qian shouted to the other residential building managers that they had no time to waste and that they needed to take action. However, Li Jian said that these conditions were too harsh and unfair for everyone to cooperate. Li Jian was very annoyed by how the two of them changed their point of view so quickly, naively believing that this would somehow save them. Tian Fan said that they should not try to solve the current problem so frivolously, but Wang Qian said that they had agreed in advance that they would all make such decisions together. Meanwhile, Zhang went out onto the balcony and noticed that a lot of people were moving towards the building. Zhang, in a fit of rage, pointed a gun at the managers one of the residential buildings and demanded an explanation from them as to how they dared to send more people here. Wang Qian told Zhang that if they did this, they would be risking their lives greatly, and Zhang said that he wanted to check something before they left the building. Li Jian proposed to stop everything, since the risk of deaths among ordinary residents was too great. However, Zhang became even more angry and ordered everyone to sit down right now. At that moment, the residents of this building burst into the apartment and put all the managers of the residential buildings in their places. When the neighbors put the leaders in their places, they immediately began to search them. Meanwhile, Zhang took out his sniper rifle and prepared to shoot into the oncoming crowd. Zhang took aim at one of the people, followed by the rest of the people. Zhang took good aim and fired his rifle and in less than a second the leader's head was shot through. A second later, Zhang fired another shot at one of the people standing next to the leader. The approaching people panicked, and in the hope of being rescued, many of them fled. However, Zhang didn't care much about who ran where and continued to shoot people with maximum accuracy. With every second, the number of lifeless bodies lying in the snow without any signs of life became more and more. The managers of the apartment buildings could do nothing but sit still and listen to Zhang's sniper rifle fire, 
and their residents screaming louder with each shot. After a couple of minutes, John stopped shooting at people, and he again asked the managers of the residential buildings if they were willing to accept his conditions. Yun Yang and Wang Qian said that they completely agreed with the conditions that Chang put forward to them. Without further ado, Chen Lin and Li Jian raised their hands to show their agreement to Zhang's terms. Li Jian also raised his hand and said that he was also ready to carry out all of Zhang's instructions. Zhang told the residential building managers that they would start working from today and tomorrow he would tell them when and where they could get their supplies. John walked past Li Jian and told him that he would keep an eye on him, hoping that he would not do this again. The managers of the residential buildings went out onto the street, where residents of the remaining buildings were waiting for them, eager to see how the negotiations went. John surprised his roommates by telling them that he had managed to reach a compromise with the other managers of the residential buildings. Gang's neighbors were curious to know how he managed to persuade the apartment building managers to agree to his terms, to which Zhang replied that he was simply intimidating them a little. Zhang told his neighbors that from that day on, he would provide for 300 more people from other residential buildings and in return they would grow plant food. Some residents were a little scared that if Zhang started giving supplies to more people, then he would give his cohabitants less supplies. Zhang then told his neighbors that if he did not agree to give supplies to residents from other buildings, sooner or later his residents would fight the rest of the residents to the death. Zhang also said that even though he would survive in any case, he was still not sure that his roommates would cope on their own. After this, Zhang told his neighbors that they should not worry about anything because he would do everything possible to find food for his neighbors and prevent them from starving. The neighbors were very touched that Zhang was willing to help them and continued to give them food. Many people shouted that Zhang's desire to help his neighbors deserved respect, and thus Zhang once again secured the trust and loyalty of his neighbors. When the neighbors went about their business, Zhang noticed some unusual expression on Uncle Yu's face suggesting that Uncle Yu was not happy with something about his plan. However, Uncle Yu said that today was simply a somewhat unusual day, which somehow did not match Shang's style. John told Uncle Yu that he had made the right decision to cooperate with the rest of the residential building managers. John also told Uncle Yu that he originally planned to get rid of all the leaders of the residential buildings at the same time, so that there would be chaos among their residents, and then he could easily finish them all off. However, Contrary to Zhang's expectations, only five residential building managers came to them, which is why he decided to find a compromise between them and wait until he could get rid of all the residential building managers at the same time. Uncle Yu said that he didn't quite understand Zhang's entire plan, but he was completely confident that Zhang was doing everything right. Zhang then explained to Uncle Yu that since they were very limited in food supplies, it would be problematic to distribute food among residents from other residential buildings. At this moment, Uncle Yu realized that these residents would kill each other themselves if there was a shortage of food for each resident, and he said that this was just a wonderful plan. John went out onto the balcony and told Uncle Yu that he was absolutely confident of his victory, since he had enough ammunition to face the managers of the residential buildings and their residents. Looking at the corpses of the shot residents of other buildings, John thought that he was much more superior to them in his firepower, and they would not be able to resist him while they were worried about a basic lack of food. John also noted that he could defeat even a world champion if he did not eat for 30 days. Zhang's plan was, John said that he could not be defeated by an army of people who had not received nutrients for a long time. John said that these people were not as stupid as they might seem, and they probably understood his whole plan. But at the same time, they were not the only ones interested in such payment. Jean believed that these people had their own interests, and would not attack him without a known reason. Jean also thought that if these people really wanted to stay alive under such conditions, then they would definitely not do anything provocative or too radical. However, Uncle Yu did not fully understand the point of these people farming in such conditions to which Zhang said that he did this only to make them as exhausted as possible. Uncle Yu said that he now fully understood Zhang's entire plan and that he would do his best. Zhang only asked Uncle Yu to keep this plan a secret and just follow the plan. Returning home, Zhang also thought that there could be enemies not only outside, but also among his neighbors who still wished him dead. Zhang returned home and saw Dr. Zhou doing yoga. Dr. Zhou, who was doing the splits, saw Zhang come home and said that she was glad that Zhang had finally come home. Dr. Zhou stood up from the splits, hugged Zhang, and asked him how his negotiations with the apartment building managers went. Zhang, 
who was happy to see Dr. Zhou again, picked her up and dragged her towards the bed. Zhang put Dr. Zhou on the bed and told her that she should never leave the apartment for the next few days. Zhang told Dr. Zhou that if everything went according to his plan, then soon all their troubles would be over. The next day, residents from other residential buildings came out onto the street to get to work together. A huge crowd formed on the street, and every person in the crowd had shovels hose and other tools for farming. Many were glad that they had gathered in such a large group in order to work hard for the common good. While the other residents were working, Yun Yang and Wang Qian were smoking cigarettes and watching how hard their roommates were working. Zhang came out of the building to check on the work of residents from other buildings and go on reconnaissance in search of supplies. Yun Yang and Wang Qian saw Zhang and began offering to help him find supplies, hoping to find out where Zhang was hiding his snowmobile. However, Zhang reminded the guys that he had a snowmobile, and that he was able to bring the supplies he found along the way on his own. Zhang then shouted to residents from other buildings that when he returned, he would definitely check their work, Aang's instructions, and they began to work even harder, hoping that Zhang would provide them with many different supplies for their hard work. Yun Yang told Wang Qian that he had searched all possible places where Zhang could have hidden the snowmobile, but Wang Qian still thought that they were not looking for a snowmobile but a sled. A few minutes later, Zhang arrived at one of the local stores and broke into it to find various supplies. Once inside the store, Zhang found one abandoned pharmacy. While searching for supplies, Zhang manages to find a special drug that had no taste or smell. Zhang believed that with this drug he could easily poison all the residents from other buildings, and without medical intervention they would die in a matter of minutes. Zhang decided to take the entire supply of drugs for himself thinking that even if the drug did not kill these people, it would certainly cause various damage to their vital organs. The drug should work within the first 15 minutes after application, and Zhang thought that he needed to reduce the vigilance of the residents of other buildings as much as possible. Zhang then decided that it would be best to soak all the food for the residents of other buildings with this drug, so that they would all be poisoned from hunger as soon as possible. A few minutes later, Residents of other buildings saw Zhang walking towards them with several large bags filled with food. Residents of other buildings were very surprised that Zhang was able to get so much food, to which he himself said that this time he had to go a little further than usual. Residents of other buildings began to say that such forays were more risky, but thanks to Zhang and his snowmobile, they would all remain well fed. Zhang thought that he had done everything secretly enough so that no one would suspect him of what he was up to. Zhang took out some food from his bag and told residents of other buildings to line up for food. After this, Zhang threw a bag of food towards the crowd, causing many people to begin to gather in a huge crowd in front of Zhang. As residents from other buildings continued to crowd in, Zhang took out a gun from his pocket and said that soon the relationship between everyone would become so strong that soon no one would need any weapons. Residents from other buildings were incredibly happy about Chang's help, after which Zhang began distributing food to people from other buildings one by one. When Zhang distributed all the food he had collected to the people from other buildings, he sent them to rest and told them that they should work hard tomorrow. Residents from other buildings gathered to return home with the pleasant thought that today they will sleep well fed. Zhang just looked at these naive people and thought that very soon they would all be in an extremely unpleasant state. A few minutes later, Zhang returned to his apartment, and the first thing he really wanted to do was take a shower. Zhang took a warm shower and thought that when all this was over, he would leave this place and start all over again. Meanwhile, one of the residents returned to Yun Yang's apartment, and he immediately ran to get the package of food he had received. Yun Yang reached into the bag of food and began rummaging around, hoping to find his pack of cigarettes at the bottom of the bag. Yun Yang was still able to find a pack of cigarettes in the bag, and he thought that Zhang was still able to keep his promise. However, at this moment, there were several other people smoking in the apartment with Yun Yang and they also wanted to smoke a little. Then people began to beg Yun Yang to share at least one cigarette, and Yun Yang calculated that if he gave each person one cigarette, he would have at least half of the entire pack left. Yun Yang gave each of them a cigarette, and said that it was with great difficulty that he got these cigarettes. Yun Yang said that he was willing to share cigarettes if everyone who received a cigarette from him should work harder in the future to continue receiving a cigarette. After everyone had received a cigarette, Yun Yang took the bag of food and called everyone present into the kitchen to share the food among themselves. After that, 
all the people present sat down in their places and began to leisurely eat the food that Zhang had poisoned. Yun Yang smoked a cigarette and suspected that Zhang had given them poisoned food after all, but he decided to leave his people in the dark so that tomorrow they would still continue to work hard. At that moment, in another apartment, a young couple was talking about how if they worked hard, a life without hunger would await them. The next day, Jean was awakened by loud screams from neighboring apartments. When Jean walked out onto the balcony and heard residents from other buildings arguing over which of them had worked hard and which of them had done nothing all day, Jean and Dr. Zhou sat down to have breakfast together, and Dr. Zhou was a little bothered by the shouting of people on the street, to which Jean told her to just ignore them. Meanwhile, a bunch of people on the street, with all their zeal, continued their attempts to dig their way to the ground. Zhang went outside with the thought that his plan was starting to come true faster than he expected. Before heading out to get supplies again, Zhang told Uncle Yu that there was a big shortage of food in other groups, and therefore he should try not to get into any trouble. After this, Zhang went to other buildings to give the poisoned food to local residents. Arriving at one of the buildings, Zhang began giving poisoned food to the hungry residents. Zhang then learned from the residents that they were more than satisfied with the quality of the food they received, indicating that they had indeed eaten all the food they had previously received. Zhang then gave the remaining food to other villagers, thinking to himself that soon they would all meet the same fate. Meanwhile, some people from other buildings fight against each other, accusing each other of killing their neighbors. Many people, in a fit of rage, began to throw each other from the balconies, and after the fall, few managed to survive. Meanwhile, Zhang prepared his arsenal of firearms while listening to the screams of people falling into the street from great heights. The number of people who fell out of their houses into the street grew rapidly and with every second the number of corpses on the street next to the buildings became more and more. Zhang continued to prepare his weapon, and he eagerly waited for tomorrow to finally come so he could see the result of his plan. The next day, Zhang went outside with Uncle Yu and a group of several residents from other buildings. Once outside, Zhang observed countless corpses. Zhang, Uncle Yu and a group of neighbors decided to walk a little along the street, and roughly estimate the losses of residents from other buildings. Despite such a great height of floors from which people fell, there were those who did not die immediately, but only received severe injuries, because of which many could not even move, and during the night these people simply froze to death. Uncle Yu asked Zhang if they were going to send more groups of residents from other buildings to work. Zhang told Uncle Yu that if these people want to survive, they must work and they will definitely go out to get food. Zhang also noted that if these residents from other buildings do not go outside to work, then he simply will not give them food, and sooner or later they will either go outside to work or die of hunger. Residents from other buildings who went outside with Zhang and Uncle Yu were greatly frightened, after which they immediately began to prepare for a new working day. Uncle Yu noticed that no group had come out to clear the accumulated snow, and he suggested that Zhang call the right group of people here but Zhang said that these people do not care about clearing the snow now. Jean told Uncle Yu that this night was the beginning of the struggle of ordinary people against the leaders, and if they do not solve the problem of distributing supplies among the residents on their own, then many of them will die soon. Zhang told Uncle Yu that if the situation continues to develop, then soon these people themselves will die in large numbers. Zhang also added that now this situation does not concern them in any way, and now the managers of residential buildings must figure out everything that is happening themselves. After this, Zhang wrote to a group of residential building managers that if tomorrow he did not see significant results from the residents' work, he would stop giving them food and cigarettes. The next day, Zhang and Uncle Yu saw more residents from other buildings joining the work. Zhang noticed that only 60% of the total number of workers showed up, which told him that his plan was working perfectly. At one point, Uncle Yu thought about why many people who do not know about the opportunity to get food do not begin to show proper resistance and try to fight for their lives. Zhang said that it was not a matter of distribution of supplies, but that many were not willing to risk what they had left, and so such people would try to avoid such disputes. While Zhang was talking with Uncle Yu, Chen Lin soon came to them regarding an important matter. Chen Lin told Zhang that she would like to discuss their mutual future cooperation with him. Chen Lin told Zhang that if nothing changes, sooner or later someone will be able to rob them, and the number of victims will continue to increase many times over. Zhang pretended to be as indifferent as possible in front of Chen Lin, but in his heart, he only wanted to see this as soon as possible. Then Chen Lin suggested that Zhang think about expanding the territory 
since the previous order had already been destroyed, and they urgently needed to think about creating their own kingdom, in which Zhang would be the main one, and she would help him in every possible way. Zhang could not take Chen Lin's word seriously, but she continued to prove to Zhang that this was their only option to stay alive and move on with their lives. Zhang reminded Chen Lin that all those people who once listened and sided with her soon lost their loved ones. Zhang then asked Chen Lin what guarantee was there that if he listened to her, he would not become one of those people. After that, Zhang grabbed Chen Lin even tighter, threw her into the snow, and said that he was not going to become one of those unfortunate people. Zhang walked further towards the workers, while Chen Lin shouted after Zhang that she was ready to do anything to make him listen to her and follow her plan. However, Zhang was no longer listening to Chen Lin, and he simply watched the residents from other buildings working hard. Zhang looked at these people and did not understand how these people continued to work in such a calm internal environment. A little later, Zhang was noticed by Li Jian, and he asked Zhang for what purpose he came to them here. However, instead of answering, Zhang asked Li Jian how he and his tenants managed to do this, but Li Jian did not understand what Zhang was talking about. Zhang explained to Li Jian that people from other groups had quarreled among themselves and stopped working, and he wondered how Li Jian managed to maintain a more peaceful environment between the residents. Li Jian told Zhang that he just immediately told his tenants about the results of the negotiations, and no matter how much food Zhang gives them, Li Jian always distributes the food equally among the tenants. Zhang told Li Jian that this was an excellent solution, since no one would worry about someone dying of hunger sooner or later. Li Jian wanted to ask Zhang for help, but Zhang said that he could not help them now, after which he moved on. Finally, Zhang told Li Jian that if he continued to treat his residents, he would be able to attract even more people to him and thereby increase the overall work efficiency. Zhang also told Li Jian that he did not want to be greedy in such a serious matter, and that he was unlikely to be able to save all the residents. Li Jian, not wanting to fully accept all of Zhang's words, began to think about how else he could solve this problem. After that, Zhang met Yun Yang and Wang Qian, and he told them that he would try to find cigarettes and alcohol on the outing today. Yun Yang and Wang Qian kept telling Zhang how kind and generous he was, and they encouraged Zhang to help him during his foray. Zhang pulled Yun Yang and Wang Qian close to him and told them that they were now brothers, and that he would definitely resolve any of their issues, understanding that he would soon try to get rid of them. After talking with Yun Yang and Wang Qian, Zhang began distributing food to residents from other buildings. While distributing food, one of the residents approached Zhang and quietly asked Zhang if he could get him cigarettes. Less than a second later, people in the crowd told Zhang that they too would like to receive cigarettes. Zhang calmed down the people in the crowd and said that he would try to provide cigarettes to everyone starting tomorrow. Hearing this, people stopped screaming, calmed down, and went home to their buildings. After this, two of Zhang's roommates asked him why he was so kind to these strangers, since giving these people food is already considered a very significant help. Zhang told his roommates that these kinds of demands were not so difficult for him to refuse these people. After that, Zhang went home and told everyone that work was finished for today, and everyone could go home. Shang's two roommates did not understand how he could fulfill all the privileges of strangers, while his neighbors worked day and night so as not to die of hunger. Zhang returned home, lay down on the sofa and thought about the fact that he had little time left to implement his plan. The total number of victims of internal conflict in other buildings exceeded 400 people and Zhang could not afford to wait until these people's vigilance was relaxed enough for his plan. Zhang then thought that he no longer had to wait, and was going to take action from tomorrow. That same night, Zhang went to one of the stores to pick up as many different delicious products as possible. Zhang believed that nothing would lower the vigilance of these people as much as various tasty foods. As soon as Zhang obtained the necessary products in the required quantities, he began to add rat poison to them which would definitely kill all these people. At one point, John decided to light a cigarette and think that his plan was going too well to be implemented so easily. John also thought that all the previous disagreements were not the fault of those people, and perhaps even he was simply worrying about this in vain. However, at one point John decided that he was doing all this for his own safety, and therefore he should under no circumstances stop. John firmly believed that no threat from these people could withstand his power, and influence. In the evening, Zhang returned home and called Uncle Yu and some neighbors with him to carry out his plan. Zhang told Uncle Yu and the rest of the assembled neighbors to stand there and wait 
while he distributed the food he had collected to people in other buildings. Seeing the approaching group of people, John began to distribute poison food to everyone, thinking that very soon his plan would succeed. Soon, a crowd of residents from other buildings formed next to Jean, to whom he distributed poison food. While John was distracted by reaching into his bag of food, Yun Yang pulled out a gun from his jacket to kill Zhang. Yun Yang was already ready to shoot Zhang and end his reign. However, at the last moment, Uncle Yu manages to cover Zhang's body, and Yun Yang accidentally shoots Uncle Yu. Zhang could not believe that these freaks killed Uncle Yu, the only person who, despite such harsh conditions, was still able to maintain his dignity and goodwill. While Zhang was in deep grief, one of Zhang's neighbors was also planning to knock Zhang out and finish him off as quickly as possible. At this point, Zhang said that he would not allow anyone to do something like that again, after which he pulled out a machine gun from his bosom. In a fit of rage, Zhang began shooting at all the people who were nearby, regardless of whether they were residents from other buildings or his neighbors. Many people armed with various sticks did not stop trying to kill Zhang, but Zhang managed to neutralize every resident approaching him. Soon many people decided that they could not defeat Zhang, and then all the remaining people began to run away. Many were surprised that Zhang had such a machine gun with him, and people began to run away from Zhang as quickly as possible. Zhang soon runs out of bullets in his machine gun, and instead of reloading the machine gun, Zhang takes out a pair of pistols from his jacket and continues shooting at people. After shooting most of the people, Zhang thanked Uncle Yu for taking that first shot, as Zhang now furiously wanted to avenge his death. After several minutes of shooting, the survivors were Yun Yang, Wang Qian and Chen Lin, who begged Zhang for mercy and said that they had nothing to do with this attempted riot. However, Zhang had not listened to them for a long time and fired a couple of accurate shots at Yun Yang and Wang Qian. Of all the living people, only Chen Lin remained who said that she did not even know that they were going to kill him. Hoping for Zhang's mercy, Chen Lin said that she had a daughter whom she had been wanting to wait for for a very long time. However, this time Zhang had no intention of showing his mercy, and without any regret, he shoots Chen Lin in the head. After the last shot, Zhang said that he could no longer afford to repeat what happened to him in his previous life. At that moment, behind Zhang lay the lifeless bodies of people whom he had helped survive in such conditions— and who could not appreciate all the help they received. At one point, John remembers Uncle Yu's body, and he runs to him as soon as possible to find out about his condition. To at least somehow try to help Uncle Yu, John took out a syringe with adrenaline from his jacket. John stuck the syringe into Uncle Yu's body while calling for someone to help. At that moment, there were a couple of neighbors around the corner who heard Zhang's call and they decide to help Zhang save Uncle Yu. Two neighbors carried Uncle Yu's body on a stretcher into the building and then dragged it to Zhang's apartment. Li Mei was horrified when she saw Uncle Yu's lifeless body on a stretcher. Li Mei looked at Uncle Yu's body and thought that she and her child would not be able to feel safe while Uncle Yu was in this state. Li Mei, with tears in her eyes, told Uncle Yu that he should not have protected Zhang from the shot and proved his loyalty to him, and Zhang was very irritated by such statements. After this, Li Mei asked Zhang if Uncle Yu would get back on his feet, to which Zhang told her that she had nothing to worry about. Zhang told Li Mei that he would take him to his apartment, where Dr. Zhou would operate on him and he would be fine. Then Li Mei said that if Uncle Yu did not survive, then she and her child would not be able to survive in such conditions. Zhang was perplexed that even though Zhang was still trying to save Uncle Yu, Li Mei had already believed that he would die. However, Li Mei said that she wants Uncle Yu to live along and happy life with her and her baby. When Zhang ran to his apartment, Li Mei only thought that if Uncle Yu died, Zhang would stop giving her and her baby food for nothing. When Zhang reached the apartment, he told Li Mei to return to the apartment, since she would still not be able to help him during the operation to remove the bullet. Li Mei then knelt down and said that Uncle Yu needed her to be by his side and that she could not leave him under any circumstances. Zhang looked at Uncle Yu's body and thought that if this was really necessary— then he would have to let Li Mei into his apartment. After that, Zhang and his neighbors carried Uncle Yu's body to the apartment and opened the door to bring Uncle Yu's body in and let Li Mei in. Once inside the house, Li Mei finally experienced a feeling of homely warmth that she had not experienced for a very long time. While Zhang and Dr. Zhou carried Uncle Yu's body into the apartment, Li Mei just looked at the apartment and was surprised at the presence of heating, food and a fireplace 
and she thought that she also wanted to live in such conditions. As soon as Zhang and Dr. Zhou brought Uncle Yu's body into the apartment, they saw Li Mei greedily drinking their water. After finishing the milk, Li Mei asked Zhang if he had any supplies of milk powder. Zhang looked at Li Mei, and with every second he became angry with her. Her impudence and indifference to Uncle Yu grew stronger. Li Mei, seeing all of Zhang's anger, immediately said that she wanted to feed her child, who was very dear to Uncle Yu. Zhang told Li Mei that if she did not help, he would kick her and the child out of his apartment. Zhang then entered the kitchen and took out surgical instruments and equipment from his pocket space to perform the operation. Having taken out all the necessary utensils, Zhang placed a bed for Uncle Yu in the middle of the kitchen. When Li Mei saw Zhang using his ability, she began to ask Zhang what it was now and how he did it, but Zhang did not pay any attention to her. When Zhang put Uncle Yu on the bed, Zhang told Dr. Zhou that she must save him at all costs, and if she needed additional medicine or equipment, he would definitely get it. Dr. Zhou began the operation and said that she would do everything possible to save Uncle Yu. When Zhang asked Dr. Zhou if it was possible to save Uncle Yu, she said that if the bullet hit the vital organs, then the chances of Uncle Yu being saved would be very low. At this point, Li Mei began to cry and think about what she would do if Uncle Yu could not be saved, and Zhang immediately tried to shut her up. Zhang also told Li Mei that if Uncle Yu could not be saved, then all responsibility would lie with her. Li Mei said that if she couldn't help Uncle Yu, then she would go home. Li Mei said that she did not know how to treat illnesses or perform operations, and that if she stayed here, it would be nothing more than a waste. However, John stopped Li Mei and told her that Uncle Yu's life depended on this operation, and therefore she would have to stay here to care for him. After that, John took out a gun from his pocket and told Li Mei that even if she doesn't know how to do anything, the best thing she can do in such a situation is to stay close to Uncle Yu. Zhang, without taking his eyes off Li Mei, told her to stay in the apartment while he was away. Once in the hallway, Zhang saw neighbors who kept saying that they had nothing to do with this attack. Zhang told the neighbors that because of the people from other residential buildings, Uncle Yu was now in a serious condition, and these people should pay for what they did to Uncle Yu. The neighbors were very scared when Zhang told them that they would attack them together with him today. Zhang's neighbors didn't understand how they could attack those people, since they didn't know what those people might be up to. Zhang said that he would attack these people himself and during this time the neighbors would have to watch the building. Zhang also pointed out the barrels of fuel to the neighbors and told them to kill anyone who decided to jump down from the building. A few minutes later, Zhang and a small group of neighbors reached one of the buildings, and he ordered the neighbors to surround the entire perimeter of the building. While Zhang and his men surrounded the building, local residents came out onto their balconies to assess the situation. Many of the residents were afraid of Zhang's arrival, as they did not know how he would act this time. However, most of the residents of this building were not afraid of Zhang, since he came to their territory, and they thought that even if Zhang broke into the building, they would quickly defeat him. When Zhang's men surrounded the building, Zhang told them to watch the windows so that none of the building's occupants could escape through the windows. While the rest of Zhang's men were watching the windows of the building, one of Zhang's roommates saw him climbing through one of the windows. When Zhang was inside the building, he looked around and made sure that there was not a single person nearby. Zhang then took out many logs and bags of fuel from his pocket space. Having placed the logs all over the floor, Zhang placed bags of fuel near the logs and began to fill the logs with gasoline. Residents of the building tried to find Zhang on the street, not understanding what he was up to. Zhang had spilled almost all the fuel and was about to set it on fire with the logs. When Zhang had spilled all the fuel, he took a lighter out of his pocket and thought that the residents of this building should be very grateful to him for preventing them from freezing and dying from the cold. After that, Zhang threw the lighter into the fuel and slowly began to leave the building, which is why the fire soon consumed the entire floor. Zhang's men saw him returning from the building safe and sound. Soon the smoke began to completely engulf the building, and Zhang ordered his men to watch the windows. Meanwhile, the residents of the building began to suffocate from the advancing smoke, and they tried to open the windows. However, all the windows in the building simply froze over time, and then they began to look for a way to leave the building. John held a machine gun in his hands and recalled the times when he was in college. He often gathered around the fire with his friends and sat around it until the night. John looked at the burning building and thought that when he sat with his friends around the fire, the flames were somewhat smaller and less dangerous. Meanwhile, 
the first residents had already begun to fall out of the windows of the building to somehow escape the fire. Zhang's people looked at the people falling out of the windows of the building and thought that their home had become a trap for them, from which they were so desperately trying to get out. A few seconds later, more and more people began to fall out of the windows of the building, who wanted to save their lives and not burn alive. One of the people who fell out of the building began to crawl towards Zhang's people and ask them for help. Zhang's men remembered that he had told them to kill all people who fall out of the building without hesitation. Then some of Zhang's people began to mercilessly kill off the half-burned residents of the building, leaving these people no chance of survival. The guys who lived next door to Zhang approached one of their roommates and expressed their surprise at how easily she dealt with the residents who had fallen out of the windows. The girl looked away from the corpse and told the guy that she couldn't sit on the sidelines while the rest of the neighbors put in their efforts for Deng's sake. The corpses of residents of other buildings continued to fall out of their windows, and Zhang watched as his neighbors dealt with the corpses. Zhang also looked at the huge burning building and only thought that it would be nice if he made such a large fire again to admire such a large flame. Residents of neighboring buildings were shocked that Zhang was able to plunge such a large residential building into fire in a few minutes, and most residents believed that Zhang would soon reach their building. One of the neighbors suggested trying to fight back against Zhang, but the other neighbors thought that since Wang Qian couldn't cope with Zhang, then they definitely couldn't do anything against Zhang. Then the residents had no choice but to hope that Zhang would not harm them. When most of the residents of the burning building jumped out of their apartments onto the street and died, Zhang headed to the next building. When Zhang and his group reached the next building, the locals begged Zhang to spare them, since they had absolutely nothing to do with the recent assassination attempt on Zhang. Zhang then told the locals that he was not going to kill good people, and he told the villagers that since they had lived to this point, they probably had several lives to spare. In fact, Zhang thought that he would kill all the inhabitants of the neighboring buildings, regardless of whether they were his loyal partners or the last traitors. So much heat emanated from the burnt building that the thick layer of snow next to this building began to gradually melt. After this, Zhang set about setting fire to another building, most of whose inhabitants died in the first couple of hours. Li Jian was very scared that Zhang had so quickly dealt with the buildings whose inhabitants were trying to attack Zhang, and Li Jian was afraid that Zhang would soon come to his building. Meanwhile, Zhang was thinking that he would definitely not be able to get rid of all the residents of the neighboring buildings, and he decided to try to lower their vigilance. Zhang took out a loudspeaker and told the residents of a nearby building that he just wanted to avenge those who tried to kill him and he told the residents that if they were inclined towards him, then they had nothing to worry about. Residents of the neighboring building were incredibly relieved that Zhang was not going to kill them. After his speech, Zhang ordered his partners to return, but first Zhang's partners wanted to warm themselves up a little more near the fire of the burning building. Zhang's companions said that when they returned home, they would be very cold again, and they wanted to warm up a little before returning, so Zhang allowed them to warm up a little. To make the fire a little bigger and warmer, Shang's partners threw the dead bodies of residents of burnt buildings into the fire. Meanwhile, Zhang had reached a couple of corpses, and he wanted to know why these people decided to get rid of him. After this, Zhang began to search the remaining dead bodies of local residents to find at least some clue to their plans, and he found a phone that had survived the fall from one of the corpses. When Zhang took the phone number of one of the dead residents, he opened one closed chat, from which Zhang understood what really happened. After storming nearby residential buildings, Zhang returned home to check on Uncle Yu's condition. When Zhang looked at Uncle Yu's pleas on the machine, he thought that everything was fine with him. Zhang then approached Dr. Zhou and thanked her for the efforts she made to save Uncle Yu. At this point, Li Mei told Zhang that she and her child had not eaten anything for 24 hours, and she asked Zhang to give her and her child some food. Zhang just looked at Li Mei's face and he was once again convinced that she was crossing the line that should not be crossed. However, Zhang decided to take pity on Li Mei, 
and he gave her one package of noodles directly from his pocket space which at first scared lee may herself very much after that zhang hugged dr zhou and went to the bedroom while lee may wanted to ask zhang if he had any more food for her and the baby zhang became very angry when lee may said that she saw chicken bones in the trash can and eggs in the refrigerator then zhang could not stand it and told lee may that he only had noodles and if she didn't want to eat then she could return the package of noodles to him Li mei then told zhang that she just wanted to ask him about his food supplies after which she thanked zhang for providing her with food after which zhang and dr zhou went to the bedroom entering the bedroom dr zhou told zhang that they needed to get a good rest since lately they were increasingly faced with difficult problems when zhang began to take off dr zhou's shoes he decided to find out from her how bad Uncle Yu's condition was now. Then Dr. Zhou told Zhang that Uncle Yu was very seriously injured, because of which he lost a lot of blood, and at first Dr. Zhou thought that she would not be able to save Uncle Yu. After that, Zhang began to massage Dr. Zhou's ngoi, and he was curious to know how Dr. Zhou managed to save Uncle Yu. Zhang was shocked when Dr. Zhou said that when Uncle's pulse should have stopped, his body began to recover rapidly after which the wound healed and the bleeding decreased zhang believed that the main cause of this entire climate disaster was special gamma rays from space which also gave him special abilities then zhang suggested that he was far from the only person who had been exposed to radiation and there were still people in the world with their own unique abilities zhang also believed that in a past life he was in the same serious condition that uncle yu was in now and perhaps a similar condition awakened his abilities in him. Then Zhang believed that it was the dying state of a person that could become a prerequisite for obtaining any supernatural power. Zhang also thought that if Uncle Yu received his powers in such a critical state, is it possible to preserve his ability to accelerate regeneration and at the same time save Uncle Yu's life? After this, Zhang told Dr. Zhou that she should definitely give Uncle Yu more sedative medicine to be able to keep Uncle Yu under control. Then Dr. Zhou believed that Uncle Yu could also gain some kind of ability. Zhang said that he had never seen anything like this before, and he believed that if Uncle Yu was suddenly overcome by a feeling of rage, his apartment might suffer critical damage. Dr. Zhou told Zhang that she would definitely take care of Uncle Yu but Zhang told her to get plenty of rest. Then Dr. Zhou began to worry that Zhang had decided to entrust Li Mei with monitoring Uncle Yu's condition. Zhang told Dr. Zhou that despite her excessive impudence, Li Mei understands that if something bad happens to Uncle Yu, he will kick her out of his apartment. After that, Zhang came to the living room, where Li Mei began to quickly look for something, casting her gaze at everything. Zhang told Li Mei that she could now live with her child in the room where Uncle Yu lay and from that day on she must look after him at night. Li Mei accepted Zhang's conditions without any questions, and she immediately went into the room where Uncle Yu was lying. When Li Mei and her child went to Uncle's room, Yu Zhang thought that he had completely forgotten that he urgently needed to deal with the traitors. When night fell, Zhang prepared his equipment to once and for all deal with the man he wanted to deal with from the very beginning of the cataclysm. After Zhang prepared everything he needed, he headed to one of the residential buildings where he reached the desired apartment. When Zhang got to the desired apartment, he prepared a pistol, shot off the door lock and demolished the apartment door. As soon as Zhang opened the door, the emaciated and disfigured Yu Qing immediately attacked him with a knife in her hands. However, despite such a sudden attack, Zhang managed to put up a police shield, from the blow of which Yu Qing dropped her knife from her hands. After this, the defenseless Yu Qing fell to the floor and Zhang sarcastically told her that they had not seen each other for a long time. After this, Zhang turned his attention to the corpse of Yu Qing's friend without arms and legs, and then Zhang understood how Yu Qing was able to live in such conditions for so long. Yu Qing then started screaming at Zhang and wondering why he was still alive. Zhang took out a bat and told Yu Qing that he was able to find out about her secret plan to prepare an uprising to which Yu Qin told Zhang that it was his fault that he did not allow her to live in his apartment. Zhang then took out a bat and told Yu Qin that he was not going to bother with her and her antics anymore. Zhang swung his bat hard and hit Yu Qin's leg with all his strength, thereby breaking Yu Qin's leg. After such a strong blow, Yu Qin could not offer Zhang any resistance, and then Zhang grabbed Yu Qin by the hair and dragged her exhausted body to the window. Yu Qin begged Zhang for mercy. But Zhang had already opened the apartment window, stuck Yu Qin's body outside, and told her that he deserved the fate that awaited her. After that, Zhang, without any pity, simply let go of Yu Qin's head, 
and she immediately rushed down a few seconds later yu ching's body with a broken leg landed in a snowdrift and thus yu ching stopped showing any signs of life john looked down with a smile on his face and said that yu ching should be grateful to him for choosing such an easy death for her after which john left the building and went home the next morning zhang returned home and by that time uncle yu had finally woken up and regained consciousness faster than dr zhou expected hearing such good news Zhang asked Dr. Zhou to take good care of Uncle Yu's condition. Dr. Zhou gave Uncle Yu some sedative, and after several treatments, Dr. Zhou completed her work. Before Zhang decided to leave the apartment again, Li Mei asked Zhang to bring her a phone charger and a package of diapers for the baby. Zhang looked at Uncle Yu's body and remembered that sometimes people in a coma can hear everything that happens around them so he decided to use a little trick. Zhang looked at Li Mei and told her that he had some matters that he needed to deal with now and he told Li Mei that after these matters, he would definitely help her. When Zhang left the room with Uncle Yu, he thought that soon he would finally be able to get rid of the impudent and annoying Li Mei. After this, Zhang again went on another rebellion against the residents of other buildings. When another residential building was almost completely burned down, Zhang told his subordinates that they could now return. At this moment, one of his subordinates approached Zhang, who wanted to tell Zhang something very important. Zhang's partner told him about the hideout of Wang Ximing, who was the son of the richest man in the city, which his father spent over a billion yuan to build. Then Zhang believed that his subordinate would now tell him where Ximing's hideout was located. However, the first thing Zhang's partner said was that there were too many people in this place who could overhear them, and he suggested that Zhang talk somewhere else. When Zhang and his partner moved to a less crowded place, Zhang asked his partner to tell him everything in as much detail as possible. Zhang's partner said that Si Ming's hideout is located in the Yinka estate, which is worth more than 250 million yuan. Zhang then asked his partner why he decided to tell him about this hideout. Zhang's partner said that he wanted to prove his loyalty to Zhang, and that he wanted to destroy this shelter and take everything he needed from there. Then Zhang immediately told his partner that he did not believe his words that even if he wanted to rob and destroy the shelter, he may well not have enough strength and resources for such a dangerous task. However, the partner told Zhang that he knew where this hideout was, and that Si Ming himself found out about Zhang and decided to contact his partner. Zhang's partner also said that Si Ming suggested that he lured Zhang into a trap to steal his supplies and snowmobile. Zhang's partner immediately said that he had given up such an idea, and now he wanted to warn Zhang about it. However, John pointed the gun at his partner and asked him how he could prove to him that he was not deceiving him. Zhang's partner was very scared, and he begged John to spare him and let him live. As soon as his partner fell silent, John immediately fired a pistol in his direction without any warning. However, John deliberately shot past his partner in order to intimidate him a little. Zhang's partner decided that next time John would shoot at him and the partner again began to beg Zhang to leave him alive. Zhang demanded his partner give a reason why he should believe him. Zhang's partner said that he understood perfectly well that Zhang could easily get rid of him, and even if he wanted to go over to Si Ming's side, he would not be able to live in his shelter for long. Then the partner told Zhang how even before the cataclysm he served Si Ming, and at that time it was very difficult for the partner to restrain all the negative emotions towards Si Ming. The partner also said that in the past he often had to take on the role of a pimp, who had to look for the best girls in the city for Si Ming. On top of that, his partner said that during the entire time he was Si Ming's slave, he became a real laughing stock for the local oligarchs, and he wanted to take revenge on Si Ming, even if Zhang did not want to help him. After hearing his partner's story, Zhang decided to ask him how exactly he would help him if he agreed to help him. Then the partner said that he could pretend to Si Ming that he had deceived Zhang, after which they would end up in Si Ming's hideout, and then Zhang could easily finish him off. Then Zhang asked his partner how advanced the defense system was in this shelter, and how many weapons there were. In response, his partner only said that he would tell Zhang everything only if he agreed to cooperate with him in this matter, and after that he would provide him with food and clothing. In response to such insolence, Zhang again pointed the gun at his partner with the thought of why he then needed such a partner, to which he said that even so he would not tell Zhang anything. Then his partner said that he understood that Zhang was only getting rid of those people who were of no value to him, and information about the shelter was his only chance to survive. After these words, John put the gun away and told his partner that he was much smarter than he thought, 
and that he was ready to help him if he agreed to his terms. The partner was glad that John not only left him alive, but also decided to help him, and he said that he was ready to fulfill any demands of John. The first thing John said was that he needed to know more details about the shelter and its security system, and his partner said that he knew this shelter well, since he had been there so many times. In addition, John wanted his partner to help him get rid of one person, to which his partner only asked why Zhang himself could not kill this person with his combat arsenal. Zhang told his partner that it was extremely difficult for him to deal with this person who needed to be killed, and so Zhang wanted his partner to help him in this matter. Before telling his partner the last condition, he asked him to go with him to give him everything he needed. A couple of minutes later, Zhang returned to his partner with a small suitcase and his partner believed that this suitcase contained a special device that special agents use. John pretended that it was so, and he told his partner that at first he wanted to go undercover, but since his partner saw through him, he would have to reveal one of his trump cards. While John was looking for something in the suitcase, his partner thought that in the past John could be a real retired killer, since John can kill people so easily. Then his partner suggested that since he was on Shang's side, he could easily survive this end of the world. After a couple of seconds, John took out a syringe with some substance from his suitcase and told his partner that he had previously used similar serums to hold problematic prisoners. The partner was very scared when John brought his syringe closer to his partner's face, and he did not understand what John was going to do with him. John told his partner that if this substance is introduced into the human body, then without an antidote the person will definitely die within a week. At that moment, the partner fell to the floor in fear, and John told him that he would give him the antidote when they broke into Si Ming's hideout and destroyed it. John then grabbed his partner and began to hold him down while he injected the substance from the syringe into his partner's body. When Zhang injected the substance into his partner, he told him that he was now under Zhang's complete control. After this, John tried to calm his partner down, explaining to him that when they were done with this shelter, he would definitely give him the antidote. Then the partner told Zhang that they should trust each other, and that if he did die, then Zhang would also have to die. After that, Zhang released his partner, who said that he would definitely contact Si Ming and inform him that he and Zhang would soon arrive as soon as possible. While his partner was returning to his apartment, Zhang thought that his partner had not realized that Zhang had deceived him. In fact, Instead of a deadly substance, the syringe contained a special medicine, which only in large doses was capable of causing some side effects in the human body. However, John believed that if his partner still believed that there was a dangerous substance in his body, then the risk that he would be willing to betray him became extremely low. After that, John went home and saw Li Mei whispering something in Uncle Yu's ear through the CCTV cameras. John looked at Li Mei and thought that when she was in a hopeless situation, she would not be smart in front of Zhang. After that, Zhang entered Uncle Yu's room, and he was very happy that Uncle Yu was finally able to come to his senses. Uncle Yu told Zhang that he was very grateful to Zhang and Dr. Zhou for saving him, and Uncle Yu wanted to know from Zhang what the situation outside was now. However, Zhang told Uncle Yu that he had nothing to worry about and should concentrate on his recovery. Meanwhile, Li Mei told Zhang that she was very grateful to him for being Uncle Yu and that she now owed Zhang her life. Suddenly Zhang told Uncle Yu that he and Li Mei had recently had a conversation about how he was now responsible for their family. Li Mei was very glad that Zhang himself decided to return to such an important conversation for her and her child. A joyful Li Mei handed her child over to Zhang and asked him to look after her child while he packed up his things from his previous apartment. Before leaving, Li Mei asked Zhang not to lock the door to the apartment, to which Zhang said that he would never do that after which Li Mei calmly left the apartment. Before leaving the apartment, Li Mei thought that since her child was with Zhang, now he could not help but let her into his apartment. When Li Mei left the apartment, Zhang texted his partner Su Hao that the person he was supposed to kill had left the apartment, and he told him to deal with this person as quickly as possible. After that, Zhang looked at Li Mei's child and thought that initially he wanted to kill the child too, but quickly changed his mind about such a decision since he simply could not come to terms with such an act. After that, John hugged Li Mei's child and believed that one day he would simply find the girl a new family. When Li Mei was about to enter her apartment to get her things, she thought that she should stay in Zhang's apartment by any means so that she could survive with her child. As soon as Li Mei opened the door to her apartment, 
Su Hao stood in front of her with an ominous expression on his face and a kitchen knife in his hands. At that same second, Su Hao plunged the knife straight into Li Mei's throat, making her chances of survival after such a wound almost zero. When Li Mei fell to the floor with a serious injury, Su Hao told her that it was all her fault. After this, Su Hao stabbed Li Mei several more times, telling her that she must die. Once Su Hao finally killed Li Mei, he wrote to Zhang that he had killed Li Mei, and that he was now awaiting his supplies. When Zhang read the message from Su Hao, he told Uncle Yu that he would like to let him live in his apartment with Li Mei and her child until the child grew up and until Uncle Yu recovered. Uncle Yu was categorically against such a proposal from Zhang, as he was afraid that if they lived in his apartment, the consumption of food and coal for heating would increase greatly. However, Zhang told Uncle Yu that he didn't need to worry about it now, and that Uncle Yu needed to gain strength and get better now. While Zhang was talking to Uncle Yu, Li Mei's child suddenly began to cry loudly. Zhang didn't know how to calm the child down, and Uncle Yu told Zhang that Li Mei usually calmed down her child easily. After that, Zhang ran to Dr. Zhou and he handed the child to her, and Dr. Zhou said that she did not know how to treat children at all. Soon, Dr. Zhou felt that she should change the baby's diapers, and then Zhang gave her a whole package of baby diapers. After this, Zhang asked Uncle Yu if he felt any unusual sensations in his body. Uncle Yu said that he did not feel strong and his wounds were very itchy, to which Zhang said that these were normal sensations as Uncle Yu's wounds were starting to recover. When the child finally calmed down and fell asleep, Zhang began to worry that Li Mei had not returned home for a long time. Uncle Yu thought that something might have happened to Li Mei, and he asked Zhang to go and check if Li Mei was okay. After this, Zhang told Dr. Zhou that she should look after Uncle Yu and the child while he was away. Before leaving the apartment, Zhang prepared police equipment. While Zhang was getting ready, in a general neighborhood chat, one of the residents told his neighbors to gather in apartment 1301, where he would distribute food to the residents on a first-come, first-served basis. Zhang wrote in a neighbor's chat that if neighbors do not want to die, then they should definitely stay at home. After some time, a large number of residents gathered in apartment 1301, where they discussed how if they wanted to survive, they should support Zhang and help him in everything. At this moment, Zhang reached apartment 1301, through the walls of which he overheard some conversations of local residents, and he became convinced that all these people were very much afraid of imminent death. After this, Zhang took out a couple of grenades, which he threw right into the very center of apartment 1301. The local residents who were in apartment 1301 did not have time to realize anything, and at that moment the grenades caused a strong explosion. To avoid being harmed by the shock wave, John covered himself with a police shield, which was able to protect him from the explosion. When the smoke cleared from apartment 1301, Zhang entered the apartment to ensure that there were no survivors left in the apartment. A man was lying near one of the walls without his left arm and legs, and he did not understand why Zhang decided to kill them, despite the fact that they helped him so much and diligently. Zhang pulled out a gun, pointed it at the surviving neighbor, and told him that they were only able to help him because he was the one who allowed them to live, after which he shot the surviving neighbor. When Zhang left apartment 1301, he thought that now he must deal with Su Hao, since Zhang has now dealt with all his enemies from his past life. Zhang also realized that there were now only five survivors left in the entire building, and now his life was not in danger. After that, Zhang began searching for Li Mei's body throughout the building, and when he found Li Mei's corpse, he dragged the body to one of the apartments and closed the apartment door, thinking that this bitch fully deserved to die. After that, Zhang returned to his apartment, and the first thing he wanted to do was tell Uncle Yu about the unpleasant news. Zhang hit the wall, feigning anger in front of Uncle Yu, and said that all the neighbors were conspiring to get rid of him and take over his supplies, and Zhang only managed to eliminate a couple of the guys. Suddenly Uncle Yu began to cry and said that he would definitely take revenge on these people who betrayed him. When Uncle Yu began to blame himself for not being able to help Zhang in any way, he hit the table he was lying on very hard. Zhang glanced at the strong dent on the table, and he was greatly amazed that Uncle Yu's strength was growing so rapidly in such a short period of time. Then Zhang began to try to calm down Uncle Yu and told him that only he was to blame for this situation, since he was able to notice the dirty trick on the part of the neighbors in time. Zhang also promised Uncle Yu that he would definitely make all the neighbors greatly regret that they decided to stand in his way. Uncle Yu was disappointed that despite how much Zhang helped all the neighbors during such a difficult time, 
they had the conscience to get rid of Zhang. Then Zhang said that he himself was to blame for everything that happened, since he did not expect that his neighbors would be able to commit such a betrayal. Zhang also told Uncle Yu that he would definitely find him a new beauty, to which Uncle Yu said with embarrassment that he would prefer some mature woman. Zhang then told Uncle Yu that he would do his best to find him the perfect soul mate. Suddenly, a worried Dr. Zhou burst into Uncle Yu's room with a child in her arms. Meanwhile, the baby was crying very loudly, and Dr. Zhou didn't know how to calm the baby down. John looked at Dr. Zhou's chest and believed that the baby was hungry and therefore needed to be fed as soon as possible. Dr. Zhou told John that she could not breastfeed the baby because she was not breastfeeding, and John then felt that it was not time for him and Dr. Zhou to have children of their own. John took the child and told Dr. Zhou that he must find a new family for this child and at the same time he was willing to provide the child with all the necessary things. Then Dr. Zhou completely agreed with Zheng's idea, and she felt that it was necessary to find people right now who could take care of the child. A few minutes later, Sean went outside with the small child in his arms to try to find the child a new family. Suddenly Zhang reached one of the residential buildings, which he decided to leave intact and the residents of this house believed that Zhang was going to kill them and burn this building. In response, Zhang fired a pistol into the air and demanded that the residents tell Li Jian to come outside right now and talk to him. After a couple of minutes, Li Jian finally left the building to find out what Zhang wanted to do this time. First, Zhang looked at Li Jian and asked him if he was afraid that he could simply kill him at any time convenient for him. Li Jian told Zhang that although he was surrounded by fear, he understood that this would not help him in any way, and he also understood that Zhang did not come to them to kill his people. Li Jian said that since Zhang came to them alone and with a child in his arms, he would not kill his people and hide behind a small child. Zhang said that Li Jian was indeed quite a smart person, and he told him that he would like to give this child to him and his people. Zhang handed the child to Li Jian and told him that if he and his men took care of this child, he would leave them alone. Zhang also gave Li Jian a large backpack, which contained baby diapers, powdered milk and some food for the child. After that, Zhang put his hand on Li Jian's shoulder and warned him that he should be well aware of what would happen to him and his people if something happened to the child. Li Jian told Zhang that he need not worry about the child, and that they would not allow anything bad to happen to the child. After that, Li Jian went to his neighbors for a while to hand the child over to them. When Li Jian returned to Zhang, Zhang asked him how many neighbors he had left, to which Li Jian replied that there were 66 people left alive. Zhang did not understand how Li Jian's people were going to continue to survive, to which Li Jian said that since they had lived to see this day, they could cope. Li Jian looked at his men and said that he believed that he and his men would be fine as long as they had hope. Zhang then told Li Jian that the food problem was much easier to solve than he thought. Zhang pointed to one of the buildings that he burned down and he said that after the fire there was enough food left there for Li Jian to feed his people. Li Jian told Zhang that if he and his people did this, they would suffer the same cruel fate that befell the residents who died in this building. Li Jian also said that even in such difficult conditions, he and his people intend to preserve their humanity, and even if death overtakes them, they will die with dignity. Zhang listened to Li Jian and thought that even when the world was literally collapsing around him and his people, they still remained true to their beliefs and moral values. When Li Jian finished speaking, Zhang told him that he was simply shocked that Li Jian and his people were able to remain the same people as before the cataclysm. However, Li Jian was sorry that he would not be able to make the lives of many people better under such conditions as Zhang had done. After that, Li Jian wanted to ask Zhang for something, but Zhang immediately interrupted Li Jian and told him that he already knew very well what he would ask him for now. Li Jian did not understand why Zhang refused to help him, while before, despite the fact that there were many more people, he was still able to supply them with food. Li Jian also told Zhang that it was thanks to him that all these people could survive, to which Zhang only said that Li Jian should stop thinking about it, and just forget about it. Zhang said that he is not a god who should help everyone around him, and that all people will have to suffer sooner or later. Zhang also told Li Jian that in times like these, everyone should care exclusively about their own lives, while I, like Zhang himself, plans to live the rest of his life in warmth and comfort. Before he left, Zhang asked Li Jian for a few small bags of agricultural seeds as a parting gift. Zhang told Li Jian that he was able to prove to him that even in such difficult times, there are always honest and kind people 
and so Zhang decided to give Li Jian and his people a second chance to survive. Meanwhile, Shang planted a few more seeds for Li Jian and his people so that they could later grow plant food from them for further food. Finally, Zhang told Li Jian and his men that if they wanted to survive, they must do everything in their power. At first, the residents thought that they would not be able to grow anything in such harsh climatic conditions. However, one of the residents, who used to work as a professor at an agricultural university, told the other residents that they needed to collect seeds and plant them as soon as possible. Li Jian asked the professor if they would be able to plant these seeds and grow them in such unfavorable conditions for plants. Then the professor told Li Jian that if they had such a chance to grow plant food, then they should definitely take advantage of this chance. Then the rest of the residents also began to collect bags of seeds as quickly as possible. Soon Zhang returned home, and he thought that since he had dealt with all the problems, he needed to start thinking about taking over the shelter. When Zhang returned home, he told Dr. Zhou that he was very tired and hungry. Dr. Zhou immediately came into the kitchen and asked Zhang what he would like to eat today. Zhang then hugged Dr. Zhou from behind and told her that she was very cute. Dr. Zhou was very embarrassed, and she told Zhang that he should wait until Uncle Yu fell asleep. However, Zhang said that his apartment was very soundproofed, so they didn't have to worry about Uncle Yu hearing them. The next day, Sham woke up to someone's messages on his phone, and it turned out to be Su Hao. Su Hao wrote to Zhang that he was able to talk to Si Ming's men, and Zhang told him to come to his apartment. A few minutes later, Su Hao arrived at Zhang's apartment, and he was incredibly happy that for the first time in all this time, he was able to find himself in Zhang's warm and comfortable apartment. Soon, Zhang approached Su Hao and invited him to sit down to talk together. A minute later, Su Hao sat down on Zhang's knees and he wanted to tell Zhang all the details of his conversation with Si Ming in every detail as soon as possible. However, before Su Hao explained everything in detail, Zhang asked him to give him his phone number. However, Su Hao immediately panicked as he did not understand why Zhang suddenly needed his phone. Zhang then told Su Hao that he would just like to see his correspondence with Si Ming. Then Su Hao slowly and carefully took out his phone. Zhang was very annoyed that Su Hao was taking so long and then he pointed a gun at Su Hao's head to force him to quickly hand over his phone to him. Before Su Hao gave Zhang his phone, he said that he wrote some nasty things about Zhang so that Si Ming would believe him. Taking Su Hao's phone into his hands, Zhang noticed that he had been communicating with Si Ming for more than two weeks. When Zhang opened Su Hao's correspondence with Si Ming, he noticed that Su Hao had actually written a lot of nasty things about him and he also wrote that Zhang was well-armed and had a lot of supplies. When Zhang wanted to know from Su Hao how he was going to explain this correspondence to him, Su Hao said that he wrote all this solely so that Si Ming would believe him. Su Hao also reminded Zhang that he had injected poison into his body, which would cause him to die anyway if he suddenly wanted to betray Zhang, and therefore he had no reason to betray Zhang. Zhang thought that from this correspondence, Si Ming only knows that he has a lot of weapons, a snowmobile and a well-protected apartment. Zhang then felt that he should take advantage of this to lower Si Ming's guard and take him by surprise. Zhang then returned Su Hao's phone and asked him to tell him about Si Ming's hideout and his security system. Su Hao told Zhang that Si Ming's shelter was built from durable materials that are used to create spaceships, and even a nuclear explosion could not penetrate such protection. Su Hao also suggested that Zhang try to break into his hideout with the help of a well-armed crowd. Su Hao also told Zhang that despite Si Ming's lack of heavy weapons, his hideout was equipped with a large number of poisonous gas sprayers. In addition, at the entrance to the shelter, flamethrowers were built into the walls, the fire temperature of which exceeded 2,000 degrees. When Zhang finished recording, he realized that if Si Ming needed his supplies, he would probably want to kill him. Zhang then suggested that in order to successfully invade Si Ming's hideout, he simply needed to wait for the right moment. After this, Zhang told Su Hao that he was not sure that Si Ming needed him alive, and therefore if he was caught, it would be the worst possible outcome of events. When Zhang said that the biggest threat to them was the trap at the entrance, Su Hao said that they needed to pretend that he had caught Zhang so that they could pass through easily. Then Zhang told Su Hao that if he pretended that the gas affected him, then they could minimize the risks of dying from the traps of the shelter. Zhang also told Su Hao that once they managed to get inside the hideout, he would do everything possible to finish off Si Ming. Despite this plan, Zhang decided not to tell Su Hao that he had a gas mask to protect himself from the poisonous gas. After this, 
Zhang thought about how he could cope with all the difficulties with minimal effort, and at one moment a brilliant idea was born in his head. In Sheng's pocket space, time always stands in one place, and so he can use his ability in battle, which can give him a huge tactical advantage. Then Zhang believed that if he could use his ability not only as a warehouse, but also as a weapon, then this could greatly help him in the future. Zhang then told Su Hao to return to his home and to return to Zhang in a couple of days when Zhang could work out their next plan of action. However, Su Hao said that due to the poison in his body, he couldn't wait that long. Zhang then reminded Su Hao that it would take a week for the poison in his body to take effect, so he should not worry about dying in those two days. After this, Su Hao, with some anxiety due to the poison in his body, finally left Zhang's apartment and headed to his home. When Su Hao finally left, Zhang thought that he definitely needed to expand his overview of the possibilities of using his ability. After that, Zhang sat down on the sofa and began to think about how he could still use his ability in a real battle. A little later, Zhang believed that if he could absorb the flames of a flamethrower with his ability, he could gain a significant advantage over any opponent. Then John believed that if his pocket space could constantly retain the energy of the flame, then he would be able to use it to store fire in it and use it in battle. Suddenly John suddenly realized how useful his ability could be not only for storing supplies, but also for launching an attack on his opponents. John then decided to start training to use his opponent's attacks against them with his ability as soon as possible. Suddenly Zhang remembered how he experimented with his ability on live fish, and he wondered what would happen to a person who ended up in his pocket space. Then Zhang felt that he urgently needed to find people on whom he could experiment with his ability. After some time, Zhang found one man who had been driven away by other neighbors, and Zhang decided to conduct his experiments with his ability on this man. Zhang then threw a stick at the man's feet and told him to attack him. Zhang also told the man that if he could hit him at least once, he would give him a piece of bread. The man was motivated, and within a second he grabbed a stick and tried to attack Zhang. However, at this moment, Zhang extended his hand forward and began to use his abilities, and at that very second he was able to tighten the stick. When Zhang began to pull the man in, he tried to escape but he did not have enough strength to break free from Zhang's ability. After a few seconds, Zhang managed to completely pull the man's body into his pocket space. Zhang then moved into his pocket space and noticed that the man had become completely motionless. The first thing Zhang decided to do was check the man's pulse and breathing, but the man's heart was not beating and his pulse had stopped. Zhang then wondered if the man could return to normal if released from his pocket space. After a few seconds, Zhang released the man from the pocket space into the real world. At first, the worried man caught his breath and told Zhang that for a moment, he thought he was dead. Zhang felt that even now the man was still experiencing some of the effects of his ability, and he told the man that he would indeed die soon. Zhang then went down to the man and asked him how he was feeling right now. The man told Zhang that he felt like he was inside a huge white cloud into which a pile of garbage was being dumped. The man also told Zhang that it seemed to him that he had been in this state for an eternity, and then the man believed that he was simply hallucinating. Then Zhang realized that time in his pocket space passed hundreds of times slower than in reality. Zhang then believed that the more any living being was in his pocket space, the higher the likelihood that that object would suffer a mental breakdown. Zhang also became interested in what would happen to a person if he was harmed in such a static state. Zhang then took out a knife and cut off two of the man's fingers to test his reaction. The man immediately screamed, and his severed fingers immediately fell away. Zhang then theorized that if he physically harmed a person who was in his pocket space, that person would leave his pocket space. John then gave the man some treatment for his wounds and told him that they would continue experimenting once his wounds had fully recovered. After some time, John conducted several more experiments, from which he was able to obtain quite useful information related to his ability. While John was tending the fire, the man sat not far from him, eating the food John had provided and thanking him for his kindness. From his experiments, John learned that certain objects— such as very large objects or living people, cannot be moved into his pocket space. From these experiments, Zhang also realized that with his ability, he could open a certain channel between the worlds, and thanks to this, he could control the flow of his ability. After Zhang carried out all the necessary experiments with his ability at the moment, he began to clearly understand how he would deal with Si Ming when he got to him 
and his hideout john then approached the man and thanked him for helping him with his experiments after that john took a knife and instantly cut the happy man's throat when the man's body fell to the floor john told him that he no longer needed him for his further experiments however the man looked at john and thanked him for finally killing him after this the man said that he could finally leave this cruel world after which he closed his eyes and died with a smile on his face after that john headed to his apartment and thought that he needed to find more people for his further experiments in order to best prepare for the imminent siege of si ming's shelter after three shakes john called su hao to his place and said that today they were going to capture si ming's hideout however su hao said that he was getting worse every day and then john was surprised at how strongly su hao believed that there was real poison in his body john then decided to trick su hao a little more and he told him that he would first inject him with some antidote to relieve the symptoms of the poison a little then su hao immediately put his hand in front of zhang so that he would inject him with the antidote as soon as possible zhang took out a syringe and told su hao that he would still die in five days even though he now had the antidote in his body when zhang administered the antidote to su hao su hao said that he would do everything possible to make the attack on si ming's hideout as easy and effective as possible after that su hao called si ming to inform him that he would soon bring zhang to him after talking with su hao zhang began to gather everything he needed to attack si ming at this moment dr zhou wanted to know what zhang decided to do this time and zhang told dr zhou that he would tell her everything when he returned home before leaving zhang told dr zhou that he had left her and uncle yu food for two weeks in case he did not return to her dr zhou was afraid for zhang and she immediately began to hug him tightly dr zhou began to worry greatly that john had again decided to get involved in some very dangerous business however john told dr zhou that he never does anything he is not sure of john also said that he is the most afraid of death and therefore he is not going to die after which he kissed dr zhou before leaving with su hao to see ming's hideout john told dr zhou that when he returned he and Dr. Zhou would definitely continue what they had just started. When Zhang finally left the apartment, Dr. Zhou began to worry even more that something might happen to Zhang. When Zhang got on the snowmobile, he took out a rope and asked Su Hao to extend his hands to him. And Su Hao felt that Zhang still did not believe that he wanted to help and was not going to betray him. However, Zhang said that it would simply be easier for him if Su Hao sat with his hands tied. And when they got to the hideout, su hao would look more convincing su hao had no choice but to go with zhang with his hands tied after which zhang still tied su hao's hands and they went together to see ming's hideout while su hao was sitting on the snowmobile a strong storm began and he asked zhang for a spare helmet but zhang said that was such a heavy look su hao would look even more convincing after some time zhang and su hao finally reached the prestigious area where si ming lived on the way Zhang admired how well the residents had chosen for such a premium area, from where they could see rivers and mountains. Zhang also drew attention to such a successful landscape in which it was possible to make an ideal shelter. And with all this, there was much less snow in this area than in other areas of the city. Zhang was also surprised by the fact that despite such severe consequences of the cataclysm, this area suffered only extremely little damage. However, Su Hao told Zhang that despite all the luxury of the area, the locals still had to endure the horrors of the cataclysm, while Zhang still lives in warmth and comfort. After that, Zhang and Su Hao set off on foot, but Su Hao believed that it would be better if they continued to move on a snowmobile. One of the local residents saw through the window how Zhang and Su Hao arrived here on a snowmobile, and she believed that the snowmobile was a necessary tool for survival in such conditions. The girl was also afraid that she and her neighbors would soon run out of fuel and when this happened they would only have to rely on outside help. The girl also believed that if she wanted to stay alive, she would have to take significant risks. Soon Jia and Su Hao reached one building, which is presumably the entrance to Si Ming's hideout. Zhang then pointed the gun at Su Hao and told him to open the door right now, and the frightened Su Hao said that they just had to wait a little while for the door to open. After that, Su Hao said that he would now open the door after which he approached the camera above the entrance to the shelter. Si Ming looked at one of the monitors and was surprised that Su Hao arrived a day earlier than expected. Si Ming was also unhappy that they arrived here without a snowmobile, and Si Ming decided not to open the door. At this moment, Zhang told Su Hao that if he did not open this door right now, he would shoot him immediately, 
and Su Hao decided to try to open the door again. Su Hao looked at the camera again and said that he had worked hard to get here, and he demanded that the door to the bunker be finally opened for him. Si Ming told Su Hao that if he tried to do anything unexpected, he would immediately set him on fire. After that, Si Ming finally opened the door, and Zhang and Su Hao were able to go inside. When Zhang and Su Hao found themselves in the corridor of the shelter, Zhang never ceased to be amazed at how much money Si Ming had invested in creating this shelter. At one point, Su Hao pointed Zhang to a door at the other end of the corridor that could lead them to the shelter. Through the CCTV cameras, Si Ming saw that Zhang and Su Hao were in the corridor, and he decided to start releasing the gas as soon as possible. Suddenly Zhang and Su Hao noticed that sleeping gas began to come out of the ventilation system. Then it seemed to Zhang and Su Hao that they were in an extremely hopeless situation. While the gas was spreading throughout the corridor, Zhang told Su Hao to open the door right now. However, Su Hao told Zhang that he would wait until Zhang died to take his supplies and snowmobile. Then Zhang realized that Su Hao wanted to betray him from the very beginning and he promised Su Hao that he would kill him. But Su Hao said that even if he shot him, he would still die at the hands of Si Ming. After a few seconds, Si Ming stopped supplying the sleeping gas, and he was pleased that he was able to neutralize Zhang along with Su Hao at the same time. When the supply of sleeping gas ended, Su Hao lay unconscious on the floor, while Zhang with a gas mask pulled the remaining sleeping gas into his pocket space. Soon, the door to the hideout opened, and Zhang decided that he should wait for Si Ming to get closer so that he could more easily disarm him. However, Zhang saw that instead of Si Ming, an unknown man with a knife and rope entered the corridor. While the man was examining Su Hao's body, Zhang believed that this guy was the famous actor Lin Gu. While Lin Gu was dragging the neutralized bodies, Zhang remembered the rumors that Lin Gu and Si Ming were on very good terms, and that was why Lin Gu was in this hideout. A few minutes later, Lin Gu reached Si Ming and threw the bodies of Su Hao and Zhang in front of him. When Si Ming approached Zhang's body, Lin Gu said that this guy was just an idiot, whom he dealt with so easily. Then Si Ming told Lin Gu that he would have been able to deal with Zhang anyway, since he had invested a lot of money into his entire shelter security system. While Lin Gu and Si Ming were discussing their future plans, Zhang released the sleeping gas he had collected earlier from his pocket space. After a couple of seconds, Si Ming and Lin Gu began to feel an inexplicable feeling of extreme fatigue and loss of strength. Also, Si Ming and Lin Gu began to see some hallucinations in front of them, after which they both fell to the floor unconscious. After Si Ming fell to the floor unconscious, Zhang cut the ropes with which Lin Gu had tied him. When Zhang managed to free himself, he went to the neutralized bodies of Si Ming and Lin Gu, after which he tied up and searched them. After this, Zhang decided to take a short walk around the territory of the shelter to roughly assess its scale. The first thing Zhang found himself in was a huge room with a bar counter, and Zhang could not believe that Si Min or continued to live comfortably even in such harsh conditions. Opening another door, Zhang found himself in a large courtyard in which many different plants grew that were able to survive even during the cataclysm. Zhang was very pleased that now this entire refuge belonged entirely to him. After this, Zhang decided to go up to the second floor to find out what other interesting and useful rooms were in this shelter. Once on the second floor of the shelter, Zhang was surprised by how many rooms there were, including a game room, a recreation room, a pet room, and much more. When Zhang opened the door to the bedroom with a water mattress, he saw a huge bed with several girls in swimsuits lying on it. Zhang looked at the girls in swimsuits and thought that even rich people can have their secrets. After that, Zhang reached the room with the animals and he wondered if Si Ming really breeds animals in such unfavorable conditions. However, when Zhang opened the door to this room, instead of seeing various animals, he saw several sleeping girls in various costumes. At one point, one of the girls woke up, and upon seeing Zhang, she addressed him as a prince and told him that they realized how wrong they were. This girl also began asking Zhang for forgiveness and begging him to let them go or give them some more time. However, when the girl grabbed Zhang's leg, Zhang only kicked her and threw her away from him. Then Zhang understood why there was practically not a single living soul around. After this, Zhang took his pistol and shot the unfortunate girls to finally put them out of their misery. After this, Zhang found one very large room that looked like the center of a shelter. In this huge room there was a lot of specialized equipment, which was responsible for many processes inside the shelter, such as the supply of energy and other vital elements. Through CCTV, 
Zhang also learned that the hideout had rooms such as a sports court and a shooting range where Zhang could train his fighting skills. Zhang also wanted to look around in several more rooms, but access to them was prohibited. Then Zhang realized that in order to explore all the rooms in this shelter, he must turn to Si Ming. Zhang then went to where he left the bound bodies of Si Ming and Lin Ge, after which he took water and poured it on both of them to wake them up. When Si Ming finally woke up, Zhang immediately told him that he needed his help. Si Ming was at a loss as to how Zhang managed to free himself and neutralize them. Zhang only told Si Ming that now, in order to survive in this harsh world, you must have some strong trump card up your sleeve. After that, Zhang took out a gun and told Si Ming that since he didn't want to talk about it, they had better change the subject. Zhang then asked Si Ming if he was willing to help him and cooperate in order to stay alive. The frightened Si Ming told Zhang that if he left him alive, they would definitely be able to discuss everything they needed with each other. Then Zhang decided to immediately tell Si Ming that his primary task was to find a stable place for his further residence in such harsh conditions. Zhang told Si Ming that it was too dangerous outside as there were very few supplies and the temperature was too cold, and Zhang then said that this shelter was an excellent place to live in such conditions. Si Ming then believed that Zhang wanted to kill him and move here permanently but Zhang told Si Ming that he was not going to kill Si Ming. Zhang also said that Si Ming's hideout is large enough for a hundred people to live here without any problems, and he said that he doesn't like killing people without any good reason. Zhang also told Si Ming that he hoped that over time they could become friends, which calmed Si Ming somewhat. Zhang also said that sooner or later this cataclysm will end, and he would like to become a good friend to a person like Si Ming who will definitely be able to help him in the future. Si Ming immediately told Zhang that when everything returned to normal, he would definitely help Zhang with everything. At this moment, Si Ming thought that Zhang was one of those people who hoped for the end of the cataclysm, and who was afraid to return to the previous calm life that existed before the cataclysm. Then Si Ming asked Zhang what he needed from him, and Zhang said that since Si Ming himself decided to cooperate with him, he would not ask him too much. The first thing Zhang did was tell Si Ming that they would now live together in this shelter, and then Zhang demanded instructions from Si Ming on how to use the shelter. Then Si Ming asked Zhang if he would spare his life if he provided him with information about the use of the shelter. Zhang once again reminded Si Ming that he does not like to kill people without any good reason, and when the cataclysm is over, he hopes to maintain his friendship with Si Ming. Si Ming realized that he had no choice but to provide Zhang with all the necessary information about the asylum, and he told him that he agreed to its terms. After this, Zhang and Si Ming went to the observation center, where Zhang obtained all the necessary data about the shelter from one of the computers. A few minutes later, Zhang forwarded some data to the shelter's management system and Zhang is now the new full owner of this shelter. After this, Si Ming demanded that Zhang untie him right now. At first, Zhang asked Si Ming to wait a little, but then he took out a knife and stabbed it straight into Si Ming's throat. After Zhang's knife was in Si Ming's throat, Zhang ordered Si Ming to take a deep breath and relax. Zhang also told Si Ming that he would first feel a little dizzy, after which the pain would go away and he would die. Si Ming looked at Zhang with a dead gaze and did not understand why he decided to get rid of him after everything he had done for him. Then Zhang told Si Ming that he had no need to store garbage that he didn't need. When Si Ming finally stopped showing signs of life, Zhang decided to clean up a little order after Si Ming. When Zhang finished clearing the traces of his crime, he looked at Su Hao and realized that since he had dealt with the most difficult thing, then dealing with Su Hao would not be difficult for him. After some time, Su Hao finally woke up, and he tried to understand what happened to him, and where he was now. When Su Hao fully came to his senses, he was very surprised that Chang still managed to cope with Si Ming. When Su Hao decided to make sure that Si Ming was really dead, Chang said that Si Ming was just trash, and Su Hao didn't need to know the rest of the details. Su Hao was so happy that Si Ming was finally dead that he even began to trample Si Ming's body and insult him in every possible way. While Su Hao was kicking Si Ming's body, Zhang pointed out the backpack in which he left Su Hao with his well-deserved reward for their successful collaboration together. When Su Hao opened the backpack, he saw a large amount of supplies in it. Su Hao immediately began to greedily eat everything in the backpack and he told Zhang that if he needed his help in the future, he could safely contact him. Zhang told Su Hao that there were very few supplies left in this shelter, and the energy would only last for five years, 
and therefore they would not be able to stay in this shelter for long at first su hao did not fully understand what zhang meant by this then zhang told su hao that during his stay si ming had used up most of all the supplies in this shelter and zhang said that su hao should have enough supplies that he gave him for a while however su hao immediately started yelling at zhang for just wanting to kick him out of this hideout and live here alone then su hao began to claim that zhang deliberately hid all the supplies in order to get rid of him as soon as possible su hao also said that he would not leave this shelter since he was the one who told zhang about this shelter zhang only asked su hao why he suddenly decided that he wanted to get rid of him but su hao could not give a clear answer and only told zhang that he was already accustomed to treating people so carelessly su hao also told zhang that if he kicked him out of the shelter he would definitely tell everyone what Zhang really was like. Su Hao also said that if this happens, sooner or later there will be a person who can put Zhang in his place. After that, Zhang took out a gun and told Su Hao that if he really wanted to do this to him, then he no longer had any reason to let Su Hao live. After this, Zhang shot Su Hao and said that anger does not make a person strong, but only instills in him a false sense of righteousness and superiority over others. After that, Zhang took the backpack, which he gave to Su Hao and thought that he would like to let him live for some more time, but he himself decided to die earlier. When Zhang dealt with Su Hao, the first thing he decided to do was take some rest in his new place of permanent residence. While resting, Zhang thought that he needed to quickly go after Dr. Zhou and bring her here. Zhang also thought that since he now has a new place to live permanently, he can give his apartment to Uncle Yu. Zhang believed that by handing over the apartment to Uncle Yu, he could repay him for his kindness, and in addition, he could look after the apartment while he lived here with Dr. Zhou. Going behind the bar, Zhang also remembered that he promised Uncle Yu to find a new woman. However, Zhang believed that now he could take his time in finding a soul mate for Uncle Yu, and he decided to first rest a little, just like Si Ming used to rest here. When Zhang found the TV remote control and turned on the TV itself, he noticed that the TV was showing foreign channels. Then Zhang became interested in how Si Ming managed to set up the channels in such a way that he could watch them even in the conditions of a worldwide cataclysm. At one point, it seemed to Zhang that Si Ming had access to all the TV channels existing in the world. After that, Zhang went to one of the rooms, in one of the walls of which he was able to find one powerful computing server. Even though Zhang didn't understand much about servers, he still realized that there was a very powerful network here with a very strong signal. Zhang believed that with such a powerful network, he could access a very large amount of useful information. After this, Zhang went to the computer center and from reliable internet sources he learned that in the first month after the start of the cataclysm, almost half of the entire population of the earth died. Also from these sources, Zhang learned that at the moment only 2 billion people on earth are trying to survive the cataclysm, and at this rate, in less than a year the Earth's population will be reduced to 5%. Zhang also found information on the internet about certain mutants and people with superpowers. Having opened one of the articles, Zhang learned that after the start of the cataclysm, some people began to manifest various superpowers after special radiation. However, in addition to people with superpowers, there were also those people in the world whose bodies were subjected to severe deformations and external changes and genetic mutations. Despite this, there were very few mutants in the world, and Zhang believed that there were also probably people in the world who were hiding their superpowers. Then Zhang decided that since the situation in the world was becoming more and more dangerous, he should stay in the shelter. Zhang then went outside and got on his snowmobile to go get Dr. Zhou and bring her to their new place of residence. However, before Zhang could start the snowmobile's engine and go after Dr. Zhou, Zhang heard someone calling him. Out of fear, Zhang took out a pistol pointed it to the side and asked who called him. Behind Zhang stood a pretty woman who wanted to say something to Zhang. Seeing the familiar face, Zhang believed that this woman was none other than Yang Mi. Yang Mi was a famous Chinese supermodel, and she was the dream of almost every man in China. Yang Mi told Zhang that she had not eaten anything for three days, and she asked Zhang if he could help her. At first, Zhang refused Yang Mi's help as politely as possible, and he told her that if she wanted to go with him, then she must have some good reason for it. Then Yang Mi said that she did not want to die, after which she looked at Zhang with emotion and told him that she was ready to literally do anything to survive. Zhang could not resist Yang Mi's gaze, and he still decided to help the girl. However, even though Zhang wanted to help Yang Mi, he did not show her his emotions and told her to follow her. 